When I was 13, I fell in love with a guy who said that he was 17. His family was from Haiti. I was a tomboy back then, so I was just excited to have somebody, anybody, like me. We started a romance. I was with him until about 16. He always snuck me around, and I obviously hid him as well. My mom would kill me if she knew that I had a boyfriend at that age. I would cut school and sneak into his house to, well, you know. His grandma, who he lived with, always creeped me out. She was indigenous and wore long, African-looking dresses and hated me. She saw me a few times and would show, outwardly show, disgust. I never understood why. Fast forward. I was 16. My boyfriend was acting weird. I got suspicious when I received some prank phone calls. I asked to see his phone logs. Long story short, I called some weird numbers and found out that he was having relations with 12 to 13 year olds, still, even though he was with me. I was so angry at this point, he was 20-ish. So I went to the police. I don't know why, I just did. They looked him up and down and told me that he wasn't 20. He was actually 27 and had had former charges for statutory rape. They asked me to tell them where he worked. Turns out, he was a pedophile the entire time. No wonder his grandma was disgusted at me. I looked like a child, and she knew his age. He was arrested, and I was asked to testify. This is where the scary stuff happens, by the way, if you've made it this far. One week before testifying, I was sleeping in my bed. I had a full-sized bed against the wall. This is important because on the other side of that wall was my mom's room. As a child, I would knock on the wall when I got scared and she would come and rescue me. That night, I was on my back when I woke up with sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I knew because I frantically tried to reach for the wall and couldn't. My limbs felt abnormally heavy and wouldn't budge. I felt serious pressure on my chest, although there was nothing on it. And then I saw it. On my left, standing or kneeling next to me, was what I would call or only describe as a demon. He didn't give me a violent vibe. What was terrifying is it was ominous. Smug, even. He looked male, dark skin, almost like a seaweed green. Texture was bumpy, rigid. I just remember extremely sharp features. Pointy nose, pointy head, pointy chin. Very triangular looking. One thing I absolutely cannot forget is the smile. He has an ear-to-ear -ear grin. A confident and perverted smile. I was terrified. Unable to scream. And then I felt it. He shoved his disgusting fingers down my throat. This is where it gets almost perverted. It was a vigorous motion. He enjoyed it. It hurt. I closed my eyes and didn't know what else to do but pray. I'm not even religious and I just prayed and prayed and begged for help. I felt the pressure lift off of my body, and my mouth was suddenly clear. I was too scared to move or open my eyes, so I pretended to continue to sleep and ignored the taste of iron in my mouth. I woke up the next morning absolutely mortified. I couldn't speak. My throat felt as if I had swallowed glass. There was blood on my pillow and in my mouth. I ran to my mom. I tried to voice what had happened. She was scared for me, but told me that it was all a dream. I didn't testify. I was scared to speak, and my throat hurt. I was just so stressed with everything, I wanted nothing to do with anybody. 
He went to jail anyways because at that point, it was the state against him, not me. Time passed. I grew terrified to sleep alone. I always felt like the demon was in my room. I never saw him again, but I felt his presence everywhere I went. I would sleep facing the door and pray before bed, always. I would hear it in my dreams, sometimes telling me, I'm still here, mocking me as I would run down the stairs in my dream and my legs would grow heavy. I would try to get out of my house, and I had to fight my body to move in my dream. There was even a time when I was at an ex-boyfriend's house years later, and I was brushing my teeth, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, felt the hairs on my body rise, and I had this insane panic knowing that the demon was there. He was literally hovering on me. I couldn't see him or smell him or anything, but I felt his presence. I ran to my ex's bed and asked him to sleep on top of me the entire night to protect me. I had never in my life broken down like that. I can't explain it. I just knew that the demon was there trying to break in again. So I was about 22 when I got a phone call from the pedophile ex. He found me and called to check on me. Despite him being sick, he did love me in his own way, I think. I don't know. I don't feel like digging into it. Point is, he found me and called. He thanked me for not testifying. He said it saved him more time in jail. I had to ask. I asked him if he knew anything about demons. I then told him what had happened and asked if he could do anything with it because I remember him telling me things about his grandma doing hoodoo. He was silent. Then he finally told me without many details that he didn't exactly know what his grandmother had done, but all he knew was that a few weeks before the trial, she had come to where he was living with another African-looking guy in very indigenous clothing and asked for a few of my things. He gave them my hairbrush with my hair on it and other trinkets that I had left behind. He told me they took it and left. He doesn't know anything else. I was livid. I never spoke to him again and changed my number. I'm 30 now. I'm still scared to sleep alone. I don't feel the demon anymore, however, but I still have PTSD. I am still scared to have the door closed in my room. I still think about it every night before bed. I pray before bed. Although I never saw him again, I still feel something heavy. Not as bad as that time with my ex years ago in the bathroom, but it's more of a subtle heaviness. Three years ago at my last apartment, which I believe was haunted, I was always so terrified. I would have scary dreams. The type that happen in your bedroom so you're not really sure if it's a dream or if it's real because everything looks the same. I remember having the urge to run out of my apartment sometimes. Just run. I would be on the couch and I would feel that fight or flight feeling and just jet toward the door and stand in the hallway outside my apartment because I was terrified for no reason. Demons exist. I won't get into other small stories that I have now because they're really not major compared to this one, but I will also say I think I have experienced angels as well. Small stuff like having lost things appear on my bed when I live alone or being in a dangerous environment and having a sudden feeling of I need to stop doing this now after seeing two pillars of parallel fog. If there's anything to feel good about, it's believing at least in the theory of opposites. If there's evil, which we know that there is, then there has to be good as well. Once a year, my parents go on a vacation together somewhere in the U.S., usually to the Bahamas or to Florida. They leave me in charge of the house with my dog and like for me to check on my nana, who lives in our basement. My dad likes to take part in this weird golfing competition with his friends, where if someone wins a certain amount of holes, they get to take home this creepy doll as sort of a trophy. 
I don't get why, but I guess it's just some running gag. Well, my dad won the competition and he brought it home before he left. I'm not at all scared of dolls. In fact, before he left, I slept with it beside me as a joke. It was basically an old baby doll with a missing eye and a brown dress. I don't know the origin of it and didn't really bother to ask. November rolls around and my parents leave for their vacation. Everything goes normal for a while, but then things start to get weird. Because I'm the stereotypical little brother, I put the doll on my sister's bed, who's in university, and took a picture to send her as a joke. She hates dolls. So I leave the room with the doll still in there and head to my room just to send the photo and move on with my life. A few minutes later, I hear a massive bang. I jump, startled, and go to look out into the hallway. My sister's bedroom door has slammed shut. Now, our hallway has no opening windows, and there wasn't any sort of draft. Even if there was, that bang sounded forceful. A little on edge, I open her door and see that the doll has fallen face forward, even though I left it sitting upright. I thought it was weird, but brought the doll back into my room and moved on. That night, I'm sleeping normally in my parents' bedroom. I have to sleep in there while my parents are away because I need to keep an eye on my dog and she refuses to sleep anywhere else. I wake up suddenly in the night, which is odd. I usually sleep all the way through the night. I check the time and see that it's around 3 a.m. This immediately scares me because I read that it's the witching hour. I glanced over at my dog, and she was awake too with her head up. Also strange. I put on my little puppy voice and ask my dog if she needs to pee, but she just stares back at me, then looks to the closet. I look to the closet too and see that it's open even though I remember shutting it before going to bed. I quickly turn the lamp on and get out of bed to close the door. I don't even bother looking inside. My teenage brain still thinks a ghost is more likely than an intruder. So I get back into bed, scroll on my phone a bit, until I fall back to sleep. I wake up the next morning as usual to feed my dog, but when I go out into the hall, I see my bedroom door is open. I always close my door when I'm not in there. Now, it was still dark out because I have to feed my dog around 6 a.m. or she throws a fit. I look inside my room, turn on the light, and the doll is on the floor. I left it on my bed. I remembered last night and am now feeling paranoid, but again, I just put the doll back on my bed and leave, deciding just to have my door open. After feeding my dog, I went back to bed to sleep a couple extra hours. That's when the most frightening thing happened. I was woken up by a loud banging sound, loud enough to wake me up, the heaviest sleeper in my family. I quickly got up and ran downstairs, my first thought being maybe my Nana had fallen in the basement and was banging for me to help her, but when I got downstairs I realized that the banging was coming from my balcony door. I saw the glass shaking, as if something was hitting it from outside. The banging was so loud that it was shaking the counters. The strangest part is that my dog was just standing in front of the door staring at it. And she's the type of dog who will start barking if a mouse farts. I'm really shaken up at this point. It's completely still outside. No wind at all. I text my parents and tell them what's going on. As soon as I do, the banging stops. They tell me it's probably nothing to worry about. I went downstairs to see my Nana, but she had no idea what happened. She's also completely deaf, so of course she couldn't hear it. She can't even walk up the stairs, so there's no way she caused any of it. That was the last weird incident that happened. The next week, my parents got back. I didn't tell them everything that happened because I didn't want them to think I'm a chicken or something. Needless to say, I moved the doll out of my room until my dad brought it back to his golf team. 
Nothing else strange occurred. I still have no idea what went on during those couple of days. I sort of wonder about the story behind that doll now, but I don't really know if I want to ask my dad. This was probably the scariest thing to happen to me in real life. It took place a couple months ago while I was sightseeing the West Coast. I was visiting a small, quiet beach town in Oregon called Newport. It's basically situated on a cliff and then down below is the beach. The beach itself is basically empty and it is huge. It goes on for endless miles and seems like something out of a movie. I've never seen something so vast in my whole life. Anyway, I had spent most of the entire day on the beach, and when it got dark, I climbed back up the cliff to where my car was. I had originally planned to sleep on the beach in a tent, but it was starting to rain, so I figured I would just sleep in my car. I had been traveling all over Oregon and California for the last month, seeing national parks and stuff, and sleeping in my car most nights anyway. And this was literally the perfect, quiet little beach town, so I figured no big deal. I got to my car, which was parked in this public lot for beachgoers at the top of the cliff. But next to my car was the sign that said no overnight parking that I hadn't seen before, so I figured dang, I guess I'll just go to another spot close by. So I looked on the maps on my phone and saw that 10 minutes away on the outside of town was a nature preserve. As I mentioned earlier, I had been staying at national parks and stuff, so I figured that it would be a nice place to sleep. The weather was beginning to get significantly worse, and I figured I should hurry. I drove there pretty fast, and by the time I did get there, it was completely dark and storming. I entered the nature preserve, which was a single road that followed the cliff line on the coast for a couple minutes with nothing but trees on one side and beach on the other. No cars, no houses, no buildings, no people for what seems like forever. As I drove down the road a little ways, I began to feel uneasy. It all seemed a little creepy, and I felt really alone, but the moon was shining bright through the clouds and the beach was visible, so I figured I was all right. I found a great peak spot on the cliff overlooking the beach and decided to back my car up on it and rest. I opened up the back of my jeep and climbed in and went to sleep. After a few hours, I woke up. I wasn't sure what had caused me to wake up, but there I was, awake. By this time, the storm had turned into a full-blown monsoon. I could barely see out my windows, the rain was so thick, but I could hear the waves of the ocean down below crashing against the beach and the wind was blowing so loud that my car was shaking. I noticed water was pouring in through the cracks of my Jeep, and I tried to reach for my phone so I could turn the light on, but I realized I left it in the front, which was blocked by all my luggage, and the only way to get there was to open up the back and step outside. I was about to open the latch and let myself out, and that was when I heard it. Laughter. It sounded like a child at first, playing, but soon I realized it had to be someone older. They had to be close to the car, too, because it was raining so hard there's no way I could hear it if it was far away. I figured it might be a cop telling me to move, but then again, it had to be like three or four in the morning, and why would they be all the way out here in this weather anyway? I froze to listen and then I could tell that it was getting closer. I obviously wanted to look up to see, but the way my jeep was parked was backing up to the end of the cliff facing the beach, and my luggage was literally stuffed all the way through the rest of the vehicle, blocking all side and front windows. I was crammed in the way back, so at the time I was literally trapped and could only see out the back window. It was at that moment that I realized how helpless I was. Her voice grew louder 
and louder. I could tell now that it was in no way a cop. She was laughing hysterically, at the top of her lungs, screaming, Ah ha 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 ha! By the steady increasing of volume, I could tell she was definitely coming up to my car. And then between laughs, I heard her creepy voice say, Oh, well, 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 what are you doing all the way out here? My heart dropped. Her voice sounded exactly like Bellatrix Lestrange from Harry Potter. And I immediately thought to myself, Oh my God, I am going to die. I sat there, frozen solid. I didn't want to move. I remember thinking to myself, this is not happening, this is not happening, this is not happening. But it was. With the storm raging outside my car, my phone being nowhere in reach, me being trapped in the back of the Jeep with no easy exit, on the edge of a cliff in the middle of nowhere, with maniacal, laughing women getting closer and closer, I was literally living in a full-blown horror film. The only thing I could do was wait. I sat there for a few more moments, and then that's when I saw her. I had poked my head up just a bit to see out the tiny space of visible window that looked to the side of my vehicle. About ten feet or so from the jeep, I could see through the thick rain and heavy fog a woman standing there facing not me, thank God, but the edge of the cliff toward the beach. Her arms were flaying up and down rapidly like a bird, and her head was twitching increasingly fast, all over in irregular patterns. Her clothes were ripped, and her voice was broken, and she literally looked like the zombies on The Walking Dead. I couldn't move. Literally all the fears built up in my head of what the source of this hysterical laughter may be came true in that second. I tried rationalizing the situation to myself like, she's on drugs, she's lost her mind, or this is someone joking, or literally anything. But every time I tried, I would peek back up and see that this is something unexplicable. It made no sense. How the hell would someone be out here in what I'm pretty sure was a Category 5 monsoon, five miles away from anything, no car, freezing temperature, standing up, screaming in the dead of night. I just couldn't believe it. She kept laughing hysterically, shaking her body all over as if she were fully possessed. I couldn't understand what words she was shouting in between laughs, but it sounded demonic. I was mortified. By the grace of God, I ended up finding a significantly large hunting knife stowed away in the bag next to me in the back of the jeep. And after taking one last good look at this bewildered, wild devil witch woman, I decided it was time to say a prayer and try my best to sleep. I honestly don't know how I managed to do that. Because if I remember right, she probably stayed there for another 30 minutes, howling at the moon. But somehow I did. And the next morning when I woke up, I slowly stepped out of my jeep, knife in hand of course, and I looked around. And there was nobody there. It was as if it had never happened. The sun was shining now, and the beach was calm. It was just me, and me alone. I totally forgot about this happening until my mom brought it up at dinner tonight, and now it's 9.30 at night and I'm scared all over again. This was back in high school, either my freshman or sophomore year. I missed the bus, and I didn't have a car at the time, so my mom had to drive me to school. The road my tiny neighborhood, more like a glorified cul-de-sac, was off of was a long stretch that had only one equally tiny other neighborhood and a few houses here and there. It was 6 a.m. or something and still dark outside, and it was colder than a witch's tit. 
As we were pulling out of the neighborhood, my mom and I both saw these three children in blue and white private school uniforms standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder at the entrance of the neighborhood on the sidewalk. It was either two girls and one boy or two boys and one girl. I didn't remember the ratio, but the girls wore a blue and white skirt slash dress outfit and the boy wore a blue short sleeve shirt with khaki shorts. This was weird for a few reasons. One, it was 40 degrees outside. They looked like they were dressed for the summer, and they didn't even wear coats or anything. Secondly, there were two schools in the area, but not a private school till the next town over, and the blue and white weren't the school's uniform colors. Third, what young kids just stand there in a single file line not doing anything but staring? No joshing around? No nothing? Yeah, right. Lastly, this wasn't where the bus stop was. It was a few blocks down. Just a sprinkle of extra creepy on top. There weren't any street lights. They were just standing there in the dark, not doing jack except for being creepy as hell. They were on the corner on the right, closest to the passenger side where I was obviously sitting. And of course, we were turning right. As we got closer, I thought that at first they didn't have faces, but it was just too shadowing and dark out, and the headlights only shone under their shoulders, which is how I can remember the outfit so vividly. Then we got closer, and I was relieved to see that they did have faces, but then got completely freaked all over again when I saw that their eyes were all black. Like supernatural Sam and Dean fighting demons all black. My mom saw it before I did, and she put the pedal to the metal and hightailed it out of there. I remember trying to look back and see them, but I couldn't since it was too dark. My mom didn't go back home until the sun rose, and it was bright enough to not be afraid anymore. Of course, no one believed me at school, and my siblings thought we were just full of it. But we know what we saw. We never saw them again after that, though. I thought that they were spirits. But after a few months, I heard about the black-eyed children on YouTube, or something that made the connection. We moved shortly after that due to unrelated reasons. This was three or four years ago, and I had blissfully forgotten all about it until my mom said, Hey, remember when? And now I want to die. I hope that my irrational anxieties and fear around children that are small enough for me to punt across the soccer field is amusing at least. I swear up and down that this story, as much as it sounds like it's a made-up, run-of-the-mill scary doll story, it is 100% true and still terrifies me. When I was a kid, I would spend a lot of time in Texas with my brother and stepmom, mainly just my brother and stepmom because my dad was in the military, and would frequently go on long trips leaving us alone in whatever house that we happened to be living at at the time. When I was about five, we moved to a very large, old Victorian house. It had three stories, not including the attic and the basement, lots of rooms, and as a little kid I found it was very fun to explore. In the attic, there was a ton of old junk that the owner of the house was storing while we were renting it, including a huge collection of beautiful handcrafted porcelain dolls. There were hundreds of them lined up neatly on the back wall in a glass case, standing on their little stands like an army ready for command, and as a little girl who loved ribbons and bows and anything girly, I was entranced. One doll in particular stood out to me. It had beautiful red hair, it was a green-eyed doll in a blue silk dress with a matching ribbon. I begged my dad to let me play with her. I felt like I needed to hold and love her and have tea parties with her. He of course refused, saying that the dolls were worth more than I could imagine and that he wanted his deposit back when we moved. He kept the door locked for good measure after catching me more than once staring in awe at the doll. A month went by and I had all but forgotten about her, choosing to simply explore the house and play in my basement room with my Barbies. That is until one day when I came home from dropping my dad off at the base and found the red-haired doll sitting on my bed. 
I was ecstatic thinking that my dad had given me the doll and left it as a surprise, so I proceeded to play with the doll every second of every day until my dad came home. As soon as my dad saw the doll, he flipped out and yelled at me, spanked me, and took the doll away to lock back up in the basement and only got more aggravated when he discovered that the attic door was still locked and he was the only one to have the key. He couldn't figure out how I could have possibly picked the lock and repicked the lock to lock it back. His solution was that I had somehow convinced my brother to do it for me. Another month went by and my dad installed another lock on the attic, warning me and my brother what would happen if he found out that we had been in there again while he was gone. That very night, when we returned home, the doll sat on my bed again, leaving me wary of its presence. Something that had once made me so happy now made me cautious and anxious. I told my stepmom, who immediately became angry and slapped me and then my brother and tried to return the doll only to find the attic door once again locked. She tore the house apart trying to find the keys that she was positive we had hidden until giving up and locking the doll in her room. The night my dad came home, I was terrified. He wouldn't speak to me or my brother at all. He only gave a short speech about how we needed to go to our rooms and not come out. The next trip he made, we didn't see him off to the base. We sat in our rooms and had a quiet evening alone. I spent the night sulking and trying to figure out how the doll had gotten back into my room. Later, after I had fallen asleep, I heard soft music box sounds that slowly woke me up. I felt something near my feet, and thinking it was my cat curled up, I reached down, only to find, instead of fur, a handful of hair. I turned on my light and screamed. What looked like every doll from the attic was in my room. They were sitting at my tea table on my dollhouse and positioned in standing position on my bed and in various parts of my room. My door slammed open and my dad appeared in the doorway where he had apparently been waiting for me to head to the attic to claim a doll. He took one look at them, grabbed me, and ran out of the house, dragging my brother and stepmom along with us. He refuses to speak of them to this day. The most important part of the story is the backstory of the red-haired doll. Apparently, the original builder and owner of the house had a daughter who died when she was about eight, and it was customary to make a doll of their likeness made out of their real hair and dressed in the same clothes that the child had worn. I think it was that little girl, because I have never felt like it was dangerous to play with the doll. I just felt like she was lonely and wanted to make a friend. I'm 30 now. When I was in my teens and early 20s, I was into really weird stuff. There's a few local shops that sell unusual oddities and antiques in my town, like art made from dead animals, skulls, pickled specimens, things like that. I started pickling my own specimens around age 20 when I figured out that it wasn't that hard. I had some articulated skeletons, but stuff that I was really interested with supposedly cursed stuff. I bought things people claimed were cursed on eBay and even drove to different states to buy things from people that they claimed were haunted. I bought three different dye buck boxes supposedly cursed from eBay. I bought numerous haunted dolls, whatever I could find. I had some weird taxidermy items too, like a couple two-headed baby chickens, a two-headed snake, stuff like that. I had a few things that I wasn't supposed to have either, but I won't get into that. Long story short, nothing weird ever happened. Not a thing. I never had one unusual, creepy experience with any of this stuff. I should start this off by saying I've never really believed in the paranormal or supernatural. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm a skeptic because I think to use that term you have to go into something deciding that it isn't real and operate from that perspective. I'm fine with saying I have no idea what it is and I can't explain it. I won't say that I don't believe in ghosts because I really don't know what a ghost is or what it's supposed to be. I've always been into aliens and was really obsessed with them when I was younger, but still never fully believed in them. I just kind of liked the idea of them. 
I'd never seen one or seen any real proof of one despite poring over documentary and late night history channel binges. So, on the subject of all things paranormal, you might could say that I'm a fox molder and that I want to believe, but never really did. Anyway, needless to say, after the following series of events, my mind is quite a bit more open. Though I won't pretend that I can tell you exactly what was going on. So I'm around 21 years old and I'm working at Walmart at the time. We had these steps that we would smoke on that were outside the tire shop that would lead up to another parking lot for a different building. I went out to smoke one day and was by myself and sat at the top of the stairs. As I was smoking, I noticed a paper bag sitting kind of underneath the bushes that were there. I don't know why, but I looked in it. I was expecting to find some empty beer bottles or something, but inside of the bag was a porcelain lamb. It wasn't particularly creepy looking, to be honest. It didn't have bleeding eyes or whatever. It just looked like something that would be on your grandma's shelf. There was a red ribbon around its neck, and it looked really new. When I picked it up, there was a note underneath it in the bag. The note said, take me home. I'll be a good little bitch, I promise. I'm not even kidding, it really said that. It was written in red ink and looked like female handwriting. Really neat. It was written on a piece of torn out standard notebook paper. I know how stupid and cliche that it sounds, but that really is what it said. Of course, being me, I brought the thing inside Walmart and stashed it under a register because I was totally going to take that home. I showed it to my friend who was working there and was kind of like, dude, look what I just found outside. Look at this note. And he was like, uh, you should definitely not take that home. But of course I was going to take it home. I lived for that kind of thing. Anyway, as soon as I set it down, I realized that it was actually a music box because I jarred it enough, I guess, to make it start playing. I looked at the bottom of it and it had one of those metal twist pins that you wind up and it plays a tune. I turned it and it was the least intimidating melody ever. It wasn't creepy at all. I was actually getting legit disappointed because if you wanted to pull a prank on someone with some scary object, this thing was doing it all wrong. I'm not sure what the melody was, I'd never heard it before, but it was in no way ominous. Fast forward to the end of the workday. I get in my car, come home, and show my then girlfriend. She was into all the same weird things that I was, so she was equally excited about this bizarre discovery. We cleared a space on our dresser for it, and from then on we just referred to it as the lamb. Things started happening immediately, like the next day. Me and my ex didn't have a great relationship, and I spent most of my time in the living room while she hung out in the bedroom. I'd work until around 11 at night and get home and stay on my computer playing games until around 3 a.m. Then, once she was asleep, I'd go in the bedroom and go to sleep myself. This way, we didn't really have to spend that much time together, and we both quietly preferred it that way. So, the very next day, I'm sitting in the living room and I hear a rustling sound coming from the kitchen. I could see the entire kitchen from where my computer was, and I assumed that it was one of our cats messing with something, but both cats were actually on the floor staring at the kitchen just as confused as I was. The sound seemed like it was coming from the top of the fridge, and it was like it was rustling around the cereal boxes and bags of chips and such that were up there. I assumed it was a mouse because we had found one in there before and went over to the kitchen to check for it. I turned on the light, and as I walked in the kitchen, I heard the grudge noise. I've only seen the grudge once because it was one of the only films that ever actually scared me. I'm not easily frightened and I generally don't care that much for horror movies, but something about the long, frog-like, gurgling croak sound of the grudge freaked me out when I was younger. The only similar thing that scared me recently was the screaming bear in Annihilation. Anyway, I start walking toward the fridge and I'm totally hearing the grudge noise. Just to reiterate, this is only impactful because this is literally one of the only things that I've ever been scared of and it was coming directly from the top of the fridge where the rustling sound had been. I froze dead in place and so did my cats. 
They did not want to go anywhere near that. I had no idea what to do. I was literally on the verge of passing out. So I tried to articulate this in my head and I decided that the fridge must be broken, that a fan or something in it must be grinding. I crammed that thought into my head and I sat back down in my chair and put on my headphones. I did leave the light on, I'll admit. Normally I sat in total darkness. I was really trying to convince myself that the fridge was making that sound, but I was finding it incredibly hard to do so. I was also in panic mode and I was thinking, what do movies and ghost shows and stuff say? Don't acknowledge that it exists. So I became the dad in every horror film and I just said, the fridge is broken, and went back to playing WoW while on the verge of jumping out of my own skin and using my headphones to drown out the noise. I actually sat there for way longer than I normally even played WoW because I was genuinely terrified to either move or take my headphones off. I had this horrible thought in my head that as soon as I removed my headphones, I would hear the noise like right next to my ear and turn and some old woman would eat my face or something. I had no idea how long it went on or when it stopped. I literally sat there until sunrise. I never went to sleep and I used an Elvis playlist and chatting to my guildmates in WoW to distract me as best as I could. But I literally just sat there frozen in terror the entire night until the sun came up and my girlfriend woke up. She came in the living room around 8am and was pissed off at me because I never went to bed. She complained that I played games too much, even though we both knew she didn't want me around any more than I wanted to be around her. But our relationship issues aside, she was badgering me about being on the computer all night and I just said, I don't want to talk about it. And she let it go. She softened up quite a bit, looked a little confused, but I think that she could tell I was freaked out. Then she proceeded to freak me out even further. She showed me her arm and said the cat scratched the hell out of me last night. And she did indeed have what appeared to be a cat scratch running down the length of her forearm. The problem was, she kept the bedroom door closed, and like I said, both of the cats were in the living room with me, and I hadn't moved from that chair. No one let the cat in the bedroom. In fact, when sunrise came, they were still almost in the exact same spot staring at the kitchen that they had been in when I went back to playing WoW. I didn't say anything about it. I just said, oh, dang, and I felt like I was going to be sick. Since I hadn't slept, I called in to work that day, even though in reality I really just wanted to leave. So I did an unusual thing, and me and my girlfriend went bowling for the day, then to a movie, then dinner. I was clearly acting weird because we never did anything together, and I was obviously trying to avoid the house. I asked if she wanted to go night fishing, and she finally asked me what the hell was going on. I didn't tell her, though. I didn't want to talk about it. She declined my generous offer to fish in the dark, and we ended up going home. We started our nightly ritual. She retired to the bedroom to watch TV, and I stayed in the living room. The grudge noise started within an hour of me sitting down. This time, as soon as it started, I willed my completely stiff in fear body to get up and walk down the hall to the bathroom. I left my computer running and wow open, and said I felt like watching TV. My girlfriend again remarked that I was acting weird, and I again declined to talk about it. I couldn't hear the grudge noise from the bedroom. I took some Benadryl and went to sleep when she did, which was hours before I normally went to bed. The next day I went to work and at around 9pm she called me. I was the manager of the toys department and had a bit of leeway in using my phone since no one really supervised me. I answered and she was on the phone freaking out, screaming into my ear and I could hear knocking in the background and couldn't really make out what she was saying, but finally I made out a sentence. She was saying, there's banging, someone's trying to get in through the walls. I left work and drove home and stayed on the phone with her the whole time and at some point on my drive home she left the house and started running down the street. I picked her up in her pajamas as I was driving back, and she again claimed that someone was trying to break in through the walls. She heard banging on all four walls of the bedroom. 
By this point, I was pretty certain I knew exactly what she was hearing, but I still didn't want to say anything about it. I wanted her to calm down, and I told her that it was just animals. I said that I had seen some squirrels going into a hole in the side of the wall and was afraid that we might have them in our walls. Of course, this was entirely made up, but it actually worked and she did calm down. She didn't know squirrels could live in your walls, and I convinced her that this was the case, and I told her that I would call an exterminator in the morning and have them come out and check on everything. We went back to the house, much to my despair. My squirrel story had worked on her, but that was short-lived. The way our house was set up, we had a bathroom that was connected to our bedroom, but not by a door, just by the wall. So you had to leave our bedroom and the bathroom was the next room on the right. So the bathroom wall and our bedroom wall were the same wall. Makes sense? Anyway, we got inside, she went to the bathroom and immediately started screaming again. I went in there to see what she was screaming at and it looked like a tiger had been clawing at the bedroom wall. The one connected to our wall. The wallpaper was torn off about six feet high and there were large gashes in the drywall beneath it. Reminder, this is all about four days into having this lamb. At this point, we got in the car and I told her about the sound I had been hearing. Her initial reaction was that we needed to get rid of the lamb, but something told me that I couldn't. She wanted to just donate it to a thrift shop or something, but I had this weird sense of unease about doing so. I felt like we couldn't just get rid of it that way. Like someone had to know what it was and want to take it from us. I can't explain why I felt that way. I just did. At this point, we did what you probably would not expect and we actually just lived with it. Like this went on every day. We had rules about it. The first rule was that we never talked about it in the house. We never even mentioned it. We pretended that the lamb did not even exist. It was like that episode of Family Guy where they had a giant octopus living in the house and just no one wanted to talk about it. When we had something to say about it, we would always say, let's go for a drive, and the other person would know what that meant. The clawing at the bathroom wall was getting deeper all the time. Eventually, there was a huge hole in the drywall, and it was starting to claw through the drywall that was connected to our bedroom. That was when I really started to freak out. For about a year, we lived with everything. We just ignored it and pretended like nothing was happening. Every night, I sat with the grudge noise. Things would fly off of shelves, doors would slam. Straight up paranormal activity, BS, every single day. One of the worst ones was one of our pickled specimens jars just exploded. It was a bird that we had had for a while, and the mason jar exploded on the mantle in the living room. Glass went everywhere, and it took hours to find it all. The bird itself also completely exploded, sending body parts splattering around the living room. It was hell. And I had a few friends that I would tell about it every day when I came into work. Like, they would ask for updates on what the lamb had been doing, and I would tell them whatever freaky story we had for the previous day. It was a daily occurrence at that point. But then it got to a point where we couldn't ignore it anymore. My girlfriend was breaking up with bruises and scratches almost every day to the point that it had started looking like she was self-harming. She had a lot of piercings and tattoos, so she wasn't too troubled by the pain, but didn't really enjoy having to wash the blood out of the sheets every day. When it got too much was when I was sitting in the bathroom, browsing my phone, and I heard a female voice say, Hey, come here. So I finished my business and walked into the bedroom and said, Did you call me? And she replied with, I was really hoping that was you. This is about six months in. At this point, it started talking. Like, literally speaking. It had a little girl's voice. I know again, that's so cliche and stupid sounding, but it would occasionally speak and we would hear it. We never responded to it. Everything we'd read on the subject told us to never ever respond. We'd hear it at our door at night saying things like, can I come in please? Please let me in. 
At this point, you've probably tuned this out and chalked this up as some kind of excessively long, poorly written creepypasta, but I promise you, it isn't. Her whole family knew about it as well. All my friends did. Everyone knew about this thing. When we had friends come over, they would ask us about certain things that the lamb had destroyed, like, what's up with the bathroom wall? And we'd just respond by shaking our heads, and they got the message. Eventually, no one came to our place anymore. They all said that it freaked them out to be there and that they were terrified just to walk inside. Even her parents stopped coming over. Her mother wouldn't even drive down our street. Still, we ignored it. As best we could, anyway. Until one night, I'm sitting on my computer and a voice right behind me says, Hey. I thought it was my girlfriend, so without turning around, I said, Yeah, what's up? And the voice responded, Nothing. Then I realized that it wasn't her voice, and I spun around, and nothing was there. I just broke the cardinal rule, and I talked to it. I shat a brick, grabbed my girlfriend, and told her what I did while we drove around in the car. She proceeded to call me an idiot for an hour and asked what we were going to do now. Finally, I decided to Google local paranormal investigators. We contacted a local agency and sent them an email with a more condensed version of everything I've just told you. They responded in a few hours and asked me to send them a picture of the lamb. That was the first time since the day we set it down that I had ever touched it again. I put it in the middle of the kitchen table, grabbed my camera, and took some pictures of it. I sent the pics away in an email and... nothing. Until this point, these people had been responding to me in a matter of hours, and now suddenly, an entire day had gone by. Then two days. In those two days, everything had escalated tenfold. The house was never quiet now. The grudge noise could be heard outside of the house, and it never stopped. Half the electronics didn't work. The TV barely worked. It would flicker on and off. The power would go on and off. The taps would start running and then close. The garbage disposal would turn on. The doors were slamming and opening non-stop. It was completely out of control, and we couldn't stay in the house anymore. Mind you, I wasn't rich. I'm living on a Walmart salary here, but we got a hotel room. I brought a laptop, and I emailed the paranormal investigators again. They replied to me this time and told me the lady who answers the emails was also their, like, medium or whatever, and that when I sent her the pictures, she locked herself in her house and has refused to come out for the past two days. They told me they were sorry, but that whatever I had was out of their league. So great, right? My house is possessed, and now it's gone apeshit because I talked to it, and the paranormal investigators don't even want to mess with it. I contemplated calling a priest or something, but I'm not religious, and I didn't know if I would have to have faith in the Lord Jesus or whatever for it to work. I contacted another paranormal investigations company in the area and sent them the same pics and basically begged them for help. This time they actually responded and were helpful, and they drove down from about two hours away just to talk to us. When they showed up at our house, nothing was happening. It was quiet, and everything looked normal. The doors were all closed, no sounds, nothing. Worse yet, they busted out all these gadgets, and I'm not going to pretend I knew what they did or what they were for. Some had lights, some made beeps, some buzzed, one made little lasers all over the house. They had recorders, microphone equipment, they saged everywhere, walked around waggling electronics at various locations. I don't know exactly what the hell they were doing, but I at least appreciated that they seemed to be trying. But they weren't getting anything. Nothing was happening. I even recorded bits of it on my own camera. Then all of a sudden, stuff did happen. My camera quit working out of nowhere. The battery just KO'd. All their noisy equipment started making noise and something was over 9,000. There were three people and they started talking to it like, if you're here, give me a sign. 
and then they asked it to knock on stuff and this went on for like two hours eventually they wrapped up and the woman who was with him said that she believed the thing who was inhabiting our lamb wasn't a spirit she said it wasn't ever a person and that it was something else she said that it was pretending to be a child to try and trick us and the fact that we weren't being tricked was angering it they left and told me that she would call me the next day she said she knew someone who might be willing to take it I couldn't fathom who would want this thing, but my girlfriend and I spent the night in the hotel room again, and I did indeed get a call from the woman the next day. She said that she had spoken with someone called John Zappas, and that he was excited and wanted the item. I didn't know who that was at the time. She told me he was the haunted collector, but that meant absolutely nothing to me. They said he had a paranormal museum. They came back to the house, got the lamb, and mailed the thing off to him. Later, I realized that the dude had a TV show and is the nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And that's basically it. Once this Zaphis dude had agreed to take it, everything stopped. We never had another weird incident happen again. I never fixed the bathroom wall, though. We moved out when we split up and left it like that for the people that we sold the house to. On a side note, I recently, like in the last six months, watched The Conjuring movies. In a very short scene, I believe, in The Conjuring 2, there's a shot of the Warren's daughter sleeping in her bed. On her nightstand is an identical lamb to the one that I had. When I saw it, I almost started crying in terror. When I was approximately 14, 15 years old, circa 1988, 89, myself and my family had two summer holidays in Portugal, one following on from the previous year. The first holiday included myself, my older sister, mom and dad, and an uncle and aunt. The second holiday the following summer was the same people except my sister who stayed at home. Both holidays were in the same location, and both times we stayed in the same villa, which was owned by a business associate of my uncle. As such, I believe the accommodation was free, and that's why it was such a great holiday option for us all. The villa was situated about a 15 minutes walk outside of a well-known town. The first holiday where my sister was also present was event-free, and nothing unexplained happened at all. The second holiday was where I alone experienced an absolutely terrifying paranormal event, which has stayed with me to this day. The villa we stayed in was on one level, as most villas are, and had a pretty standard layout. The main door at the front led straight into a kitchen, and that led into the main lounge area. Off to the left and the right of the main lounge were two ensuite bathrooms where my parents and uncle and aunt slept. I slept on a fold-out bed in the lounge area, and out to the back of the property was a small swimming pool. From memory, it was a very nice, spacious villa, and probably worth quite a bit of money. Nothing happened for the entire two-week period that we were there, except for the final night of the holiday. I often say thank God that we flew home the next morning, because I don't think I could have stayed there another night. On this final evening, everyone had just gone to bed and closed their doors, and I had just finished setting up my bed and finally turned out the lights and got under the covers. No longer than 30 seconds after getting into bed, I began to hear tapping on one of the walls. I laid there trying to guess what it might be, and just figured that it was probably one of my parents or uncle or aunt doing something in their rooms, so I ignored it. I then heard the same tapping again, but louder. I sat up in bed and tried to pinpoint where it was coming from. This is how I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis, as some people have often suggested to me, because I was peering across the dimly lit lounge room. It was then that the tapping started to spin around the room, as if the knocking was circling me as I sat there. This was naturally pretty unnerving, and I struggled to rationalize what was taking place. It was at that point that the tapping stopped, and immediately a wooden chair from the lounge room dining table made a scraping sound against the wood parquet floor that it was resting on. 
the sort of scraping noise a chair would make if you pulled it out from under the table to sit on it. At this point, I didn't know what was going on, and being as young as I was, I think fear got the better of me, and I shot down into the bed, turned around, and pulled the sheets up under my chin and closed my eyes. But unfortunately, it didn't end there. Next, I heard more scraping as dining chairs were being moved, followed by a very quiet but very distinct shuffling noise, which sounded like shuffling footsteps. These footsteps got louder as whatever it was began to approach me in the room. As it approached, I then heard this mumbling in what sounded like guttural, low-key talking, but in a language that I didn't understand or recognize. It certainly wasn't Portuguese. On top of this mumbling, I suddenly began to hear this terrifying, rasping breathing in and out in a very rhythmic fashion, the sort of rasping that someone with severe breathing difficulty would make. This breathing got louder and louder until it was right behind me, right next to my head, on the pillow, rasping loudly into my right ear. Petrified doesn't even cut it. I was simply frozen with fear. I don't think I could have turned around even if I had wanted to. This loud, heavy breathing continued for what seemed like a lifetime, but in reality was probably about 30 or 40 seconds, and then it slowly faded away and the room was left in silence. I laid in the bed for about another hour unable to sleep and listening intently for anything else, but there was nothing. Eventually, I fell asleep, probably through nervous exhaustion, and when I next woke up, it was 6 a.m., and daylight filled the room, and I recall the sheer feeling of relief. The first thing I did was get up and looked at the dining table area, and sure enough, two chairs had been moved away from their normal resting positions, and not just by a small amount, but significantly so. I also checked the rest of the communal areas in the villa to see if any doors or windows had been left open, but there was nothing. When my family got up, I told them all about what had happened, and unfortunately I was met with mainly skepticism, which I found a little upsetting at the time. To be honest, I think the experience affected me to the degree where I probably needed to go get counseling to really process it and to help get over it, but of course nothing like that was available at the time. This is an encounter I experienced in the summer of 2009. I was born and raised in the plains of Texas, specifically in an area where black-eyed kids' sightings are prevalent. I had heard the stories, tales, legends, whatever you want to call them, since I was a young man, but never truly believed them. The black-eyed kids were mainly something I entertained as a joke, or something to get a rise out of people. This changed in the summer of 2009. It was a warm night in June. I was up late, around 2 a.m., as I typically like to stay up late, especially in the summer since it would be fairly warm even after the sun went down. I had just run up to the store to grab a big fountain drink and was returning into my house through the back door when I was approached by two kids, a boy and a girl. I was very startled once I realized that they were there, since I wasn't expecting to encounter anyone in my backyard so late at night. The little boy asked, Could we come in? We need to use the phone, we're lost. This is when I noticed the blackness of their eyes. Both of them, so dark, they were like pits. This is also when my heart sank. I couldn't believe I was actually seeing them, that they were there, right in front of me. As I mentioned before, I had heard the legends of the black-eyed children most of my life, so there was no way I was going to let them in my house. I darted inside and locked the back door as quickly as I could. Once I was in, I ran upstairs and flipped on the lights to try and see if they were still outside. Thankfully, by then, they were gone. 
I had so much adrenaline pumping by that point, though, that I grabbed a weapon and began searching the house and making sure all doors and windows were locked. It took me hours to get to sleep that night, and it's an encounter that will stay with me for the rest of my life. These entities took the form of something most people view as innocent, weak, mild, and try to trick unsuspecting people and do God knows what with or to them. I'm just glad my reflexes kicked in and I was able to live to tell the tale. I'll just start with some history on the doll. I was told this by the previous owner. She was bought in Monroe, Connecticut, about 30-ish minutes away from the Warren's Occult Museum at a second-hand store. The owner who bought it felt like something was wrong with it and would often wake up with scratches and have nightmares every night. So she gave it to a friend to sell it on eBay, the man I purchased it from. The man selling it had a few stories, like one, for instance, where he had family coming over, so he hides the doll in an upstairs closet so his niece doesn't see it. The family slept downstairs, and the niece woke up at 3 a.m. crying from a nightmare, and she described the doll he had upstairs. But she never went upstairs and had never seen the doll in person, didn't even know it was there. After that experience, he wanted to sell the doll and didn't feel safe with it, so he put it in a storage unit. The company he was using called him, asking for him to come and open the unit for them to prove that there was no animal or person in there, as the security guard had heard banging and movement in the storage locker at night. I am very interested in the paranormal, so I have a collection of Ouija boards, a haunted music box, and an exorcism kit from the 70s. So I decided to purchase this doll. When it first arrived, I took it out of the box, and all four of my dogs started growling very, very aggressively and moving backward away from the doll to clarify my dogs love everyone. If a stranger broke into my house to rob us, they would greet him with wagging tails and licks. This behavior was very odd for them. As I said earlier, I have an exorcism kit, and with this kit, there's a cross that is almost locked in place with two pieces of metal. And around 30 minutes after removing the doll from the box, I heard a noise from upstairs. I went up to investigate, and it was the cross. The cross had been removed from the kit, and had fallen off of my shelf and onto the floor. I was the only one home, and all the dogs were downstairs with me, and my room door was closed. Ever since this experience, my family has been scared of the doll, so I put the doll back into the box and sealed it with salt and put it in the garage of my old house. I moved out with my girlfriend, and my family still lives there. I unfortunately forgot about it as I was packing in a hurry. I forgot to get stuff in the garage. After I moved, my mother moved into her now ex-boyfriend's house, and she put the doll in a shed. Not every night, but a lot of times throughout the week, they would look outside late at night, and the door to the shed would be open. One time when Logan went outside to close the door, he heard something move in the shed, so he went inside to check out what the noise was. When he was inside, he couldn't find anything that could have possibly made the noise, but he said he felt uncomfortable and cold, so he quickly went to leave, and just as he did, four truck tires that were sitting on a shelf fell right on top of where he had just been standing. Yes, this could have been a coincidence. But it felt like it wasn't, especially since the doll was also sitting on that shelf. After my mother broke up with Logan, she moved into an apartment and she put the doll in a closet. She's told me that nothing has really happened since, but when she's alone, she hears footsteps and knocks. The last few nights, she's been waking up around 3 a.m. hearing noises in her room, but can never see or find anything. I'll be visiting her in January, and will be bringing the doll back home with me when I leave.
When I was like 13, my mom and her boyfriend had to go to the hospital and no one would be able to get my brother to the bus stop the next morning because they had to stay overnight. So I got to miss school the next day to take my brother. After I made sure my brother got on the bus, I went home and cleaned and did random stuff like a 13 year old would do. It was around 11.45 when there was a knock on my door. Thinking it was the mailman or a neighbor or something, I opened the door and said hello. There was this kid. He couldn't have been much older than me at the time, but he had bangs that were covering his eyes, which I found weird because it was like 107 degrees out. So this kid was super still. Like, I thought that one of my friends put a mannequin there and ran away or something. But then it spoke. It sounded like a robot or something. It was like it was programmed to say this. My mother said to ask someone for a phone in fear that I get lost. Do you have a phone? At this point, I was crapping my pants because one, I'm a 13 year old girl and this older boy was dressed like a burglar and at my door with half his face covered. Two, for some reason, I just couldn't look away. I felt like if I moved or said anything other than yes, that I would explode. And three, I saw two other boys around the same age standing in my driveway dressed exactly the same way as the one in front of me. Baggy jeans, dark hoodie, and scruffed up vans. I began to stutter and shake my head. It was the only thing I could do. I finally got out a no and then started to close my door. But he put his foot in the way. Then the two others started walking up and I was going hell no. I grabbed the bat by the door and threatened him. If you don't leave right now, I'll kick your ass and then call the cops. I shouted loud enough so that at least one of my neighbors could hear, I hoped. Now, I was this short girl with Spongebob pajama pants on. I was in no way intimidating. Then he moved his foot and stepped back into the middle of the other two perfectly. Then the far right one said in the exact same tone of voice as the first, I'm sorry to bother you. I'll just come again later and ask. Internally, I was planning my funeral. Just as I was about to close the door, the first one smiled and looked up. And that was when I saw that they had black eyes. Then the other two looked up, and they were the same. I was like, nope, and slammed the door shut, then called my neighbor who was this big ass 20 something year old dude. He ran over and looked for them all around my house, but he said they were gone. When I told my mom all of this, she didn't believe me and said I was lying. Said me, the girl with absolutely no social life, who was afraid of her own shadow, was lying. I recently had an experience that I'm, well, that I'm just not sure about. I tried explaining it to my sister and I can't even begin to put into words everything that happened and how I felt. So recently I went on a bit of a road trip and visited a bunch of places in the Southwest, Utah and Colorado, Arizona, and Southern California. I stopped at a park in Colorado that I hadn't initially planned on going to, but had never been to, a place well known for its Native American history. It was absolutely beautiful. Honestly, it was amazing and humbling to see the history of the people there. It made me realize that there was so much more about American history than the rather Eurocentric view of colonialism that I was taught. Anyways, like I said, it was amazing. Given that this was November and very off-season, half the park was inaccessible and attendance was minimal. There were other people, but overall it was very quiet. I had been viewing some building ruins atop the mesa, one huge multi-room building, and not that far away another large building with a very large kiva in the middle, and on the southern side of the building, number two, was a solstice carving on the wall. I was walking around the smaller solstice building, as there was a couple walking around the large building and I enjoyed the quietness of being alone. And when I went to the large building, they went to the solstice building, and then they left and I was going back to the solstice building to get some more pics of the solstice marker. I was now alone. 
It's hard to describe exactly what I felt and how everything went down, but I'll try. It was a pretty nice day, temperature in the upper mid 50s. I'm from the Midwest, so that's still short weather to me. Some light small clouds, but not many, pleasant breeze, and a few birds chirping away, and more than a few chipmunks all over the place. As I walked around the solstice building, everything just became still. Like the wind stopped, the animals went silent and disappeared. It was just weird. There was a large, darkish cloud that came kind of out of nowhere and just hung there. There was a weird heaviness all over. And then there was this smell like what I thought was just a dead animal. Like that sickly sweet smell of rotting meat. I assumed that there was just a dead deer or rabbit or something nearby that the wind had been blowing the smell away, but the wind was gone and everything was just still and heavy. As I reached the solstice marker wall, I noticed that on top of the wall, mind you, the walls are only two foot high or so, there was a piece of pottery. I swear that this pottery had not been there before, and it wasn't there in any of my first set of pictures looking back. It was a large, broken piece, but now that I think back, it was really clean. The blacks and the whites were incredibly clear. I went and picked it up to get a closer look, and it was really beautiful. A kind of stair pattern and then an angled set of lines. It was really pretty, but it felt off. Oddly heavy for its size. I wanted to keep it, and I wanted to take it, and just kept staring at it for what felt like... God, it's so hard to describe how I felt, but the time stood still, and all I wanted was this pottery. Even now, thinking about it, I still get this weird, like, longing for it. As I held it, everything was just silent and heavy, and that smell was just so strong. But suddenly, there was this huge raven out of nowhere. Legit, it was on the wall like five feet away from me, and it was the largest bird that I had ever seen in the wild. This huge raven just cawed and flapped its wings, and I kind of snapped back to reality. Honestly, it was bigger than a freaking condor. Its body was easily three foot tall, and its wingspan was just massive. I put the pottery piece down on the wall, back where I picked it up from, and just looked at this bird, and the bird just looked back at me, and I turned and walked away. Just like that, the dark clouds blew off, and the wind returned, and there were other birds chirping, and the smell disappeared. Actually, the smell all but vanished when the giant raven appeared. I got about ten feet away from where I had been standing, just around the corner of the solstice ruins, and I turned around to see the raven, and it was gone. I didn't hear it flap its wings to fly away, and I didn't see anything in the sky, not even a shadow on the ground. It was just gone. And so was the piece of pottery. It was no longer on the wall. I went back to my car and headed back to the visitor center, as besides being totally weirded out over what had happened, it was getting late in the day and I had a fair bit of driving to do to get to my next stop down in Arizona. I had a good 35 minutes drive back to the park entrance to reflect on what had happened and how strange I had felt. Honestly, I felt like I had downed a bunch of Benadryl, I was so foggy until the raven showed up. Even now, I just really can't explain everything that I felt. When I got to the visitor center, I was the only person in the visitor center proper besides the employees, and one guy was just leaving as I entered. In the gift shop, I was getting a mug. I get a mug from each park I visit and was talking to the park ranger and the cashier who was an older American Indian woman about how awesome that the park was and how I wished that I had learned more about these cultures in school, etc. when I told them about the piece of pottery. I also said something like, Oh yeah, up at the far view sites, there's a dead animal too. When the wind dies down, you can smell it. And the park ranger and the cashier quickly looked at each other and then back to me. The cashier asked me if the smell had come before the piece of pottery, and I said yeah, that the wind had stopped and that the animals were all quiet, and I basically told them everything I said above, minus the intense urge to steal the piece of pottery, and they just looked at each other a few times and kept quiet, except when I told them about this huge raven and how it appeared. The cashier let out a gasp. 
When I finished my story, they had a few questions about the timing of things, how long everything lasted, and in what order everything had happened. And they asked me to describe the pottery and stuff, and all of a sudden the cashier said, would you like some tea? I love tea and was like, yeah, actually that sounds wonderful, thank you. And she went and got some. The ranger and I walked back towards the employee break room down the hall past the artifact restoration exhibit and she asked where I was and what I knew about the area. And I told her about how truly minimal my knowledge was about the native cultures, even those closer to my midwestern home. When the cashier returned, she handed me a cup of sage tea and she asked if I was honest about what had happened. I was really confused and said yeah and she told me to drink. The tea kind of tasted like a no-salt vegetable stock. I wished then that I had had some honey and lemon. Then they told me about what they think that I had been near. Apparently they hear a few different stories concerning skinwalker activity throughout the year, but none where someone sees the raven, and that's why they're telling me this. The cashier proceeded to tell me a bit about skinwalkers and how sometimes they curse objects to lure unsuspecting people in. She also said that the fact that the raven had appeared and removed whatever enchantments that I felt was very important, that someone greater than us was watching out for me at that moment. Because even though skinwalkers can choose many different animal forms, they would never appear as a raven due to the spiritual importance of these birds. She said that if the raven appeared to me, they could share certain information with me that they would never share with anyone. She told me that the sage would help cleanse me of any remnants of the skinwalker's tricks, and suggested that I see a shaman. I had already finished the cup of tea and was getting a little freaked out, but oddly felt more calm after hearing her speak, and I thanked them and left. I tried not to run to my car, but walked very quickly and got out of there. That night, and a night or two later, I had some very vivid dreams, but I can't remember anything of them, which is odd. I usually remember my dreams when I wake up, at least long enough to write them down. But these dreams, even though they woke me up, I couldn't recall them. I don't really know what happened, or if they were just pulling my leg. But once I got home and really started looking into these things, I kind of feel... I don't know. I feel like I'm crazy, because I can't rationalize what happened. Even when writing this, I realize how insane it all sounds, and I still can't even fully describe it. How weird everything got. It's just hard to put it into words. When I was younger, my parents had gotten divorced. My dad was an abusive alcoholic who drained my mom out of a lot of money, so my mom and I left at the time. My aunt offered to let us stay at her house until we got back on our feet. Now, my aunt lives in the countryside. It's miles of farmland and a few houses every now and then. Her neighborhood is small, but everyone keeps to themselves. The area my aunt lives in is called The Base. Apparently, soldiers were housed there, and eventually died and were buried on that land. Don't know the exact history, though. Driving to her place at night is super creepy and confusing. You can easily get lost, so everyone aims to reach home before the sun sets. Now back to my story. My aunt had a second house, not too far away, where her family would go to do gardening and just chill out sometimes. My cousins and my aunt thought it would be a great idea to spend a night there. The house was an old, abandoned Baptist church converted to a house that my aunt had inherited. The previous owner was a seer woman and would do readings and even give exorcisms for people. My aunt took care of her when she was ill, therefore she gave the house to my aunt. The inside was run down, one couch for about ten of us. Yeah, it was a big family, and a dirty bathroom with an annoying, leaky pipe. Light barely entered the house during the day. It also gave an eerie vibe to it, because being in that house or on the land, it was always dead silent despite being surrounded by nature. That night, we all had these little rooms to sleep in, with there being so many of us that we had to share. 
My mom and I were in one room when I woke up to the sound of the wooden door being creaked open. I turned to see my mother upright, shaking and obviously full of fear. No one came through the door, but you could hear these loud, heavy footsteps around and inside the house. It woke everyone up, so we all huddled in the living room. All of a sudden, the lights cut off. We lit some lamps, and my uncle was getting ready to check on the noise outside when a loud banging came at the front door. It was around 1 a.m., and this place was completely deserted. We all stood still and quiet, and then the banging grew even more violent. The door began to shake, and a guttural, demonic voice was asking to be let in. Panic and terror struck all of us. My younger cousins began to scream and cry because the voice was unnatural, pure evil. The adults sent us into one room, and they formed a prayer circle in the middle of the living room. Everyone's backs were turned to the window, but I was the only one facing it, and I remember very clearly seeing a tall man with horns and a red aura looking back at me from outside. He was smiling at me, motioning me to come toward him. He had these long, black fingernails that he began to scrape the window with. At this point, everyone could hear it, but by the time they turned to the window, he had vanished. However, all the doors started banging and the windows were rattling. We kids all ran out to the living room and joined the prayer circle, reciting the mantras from my religion, and then suddenly it stopped. The sun was now peeking in. It was 6 a.m. Everything felt like an hour, but we couldn't account for the rest of the time that had passed. We stayed for a few months in my aunt's original house without ever visiting that second house. My mom eventually got remarried, so we moved. It's been about 17 years or so since that incident, and we rarely visit my aunt, like maybe once or twice a year. Since then, however, the house has been demolished. My aunt has said that strange things occurred whenever she was on that land after that incident, and she felt like she was being watched. She couldn't handle it, and they eventually sold the land, too. At my dad's house, I had this red-headed porcelain Victorian type of china doll with a green velvet dress. I was there for a couple of weeks as opposed to a couple of days, which was usually the case, because I was like 11 so I had no job and it was summer. This doll was always on the far end of my dresser, facing away from my bed. My room was set up with my headboard against the wall with the window, and the dresser was really long and ran along the same window wall. I honestly never really liked the doll. It always felt like it was angry. I don't even remember when I got it. I want to say it was from my stepmom's mom, or maybe from a garage sale? Both are likely since my stepmom's mom is Dutch and has a huge collection of weird baby dolls. None of them China though. But my stepmom also is a huge lover of all things garage sale. Like I said, I was there for a few days, this time a couple weeks. It didn't really bother me. The only thing that freaked me the hell out was a Furby that spoke without batteries. But then, all the weird stuff started. I've always slept with my door shut, and if there's an option, locked. I used to have nightmares about witches coming into my room, casting a spell on me, then leaving without me ever knowing. So if I didn't have the option of a lock, I would put something behind the door so that I would know if it was opened as I slept. Unfortunately, I did have a lock on my door, but I wasn't allowed to use it, so I always just put a couple socks behind the door. One morning I woke up, and the doll was turned toward me instead of away. I thought nothing of it, figuring that I had probably just bumped it, especially since the socks weren't moved. Again the next morning, it was a couple inches closer to my bed. I have always been a believer in the supernatural, so I was trying really hard not to get scared, especially since I'd had this doll for a while and it had never done anything sketchy. The next morning, it was almost falling off the edge of the dresser it was so close to me. I checked the socks. They hadn't been moved, so no one had come into my room. I threw her into a pile of clothes face down in my closet. 
The next morning, I checked the socks. Again, they hadn't moved. But when I checked the doll, she was facing up. Needless to say, it creeped me right the hell out. So, being the lovely older sister that I was, I gave it to my little sister, who would have been about four at the time. The next day, she brought it back to me saying, I don't like it, it's angry, or something along those lines. I sat with this doll on my bed for a while, thinking, what do I do? I've got this doll that probably wants to murder me, but I can't throw it out because it's good quality and my parents are huge skeptics. And I finally decided that if it's angry, maybe it was because nobody was nice to it. So I took a Barbie brush and started brushing out all of her knots and frizz and tried to get some of the ringlets back to her hair. I cleaned the dirt off of her face, I straightened her dress, all that. I put her on my dresser afterward, and for six years, nothing happened until, on one of the weekends when I was at my dad's, my sister asked if she could have it because it was pretty, quote-unquote. I guess she forgot the one time she did have it. I got a call a few days later from my dad, letting me know that my sister had thrown my doll out of her second floor window and broke it. The next time I was there, I asked her why, and she told me that every time she woke up, that the doll was somewhere different from where it was when she had gone to bed. I would like to preface by saying that I am a Roman Catholic who has experienced paranormal phenomena since I was five. My late grandmother had experienced similar phenomena, and my mother and sisters also, but to a much lesser degree. As I get older, I notice the experiences are slightly more darker in nature. I know very little of demonology, other than what has been referenced in the Bible. I try to stay away from anything referencing demons, the devil, etc., which is why this experience was so difficult and I was not prepared. In October of 2018, I was admitted to the hospital due to an electrolyte imbalance. I was in a room with three other female patients. On my second night, my arms were finally free of the IV, so I was able to move around and assist the other women, who weren't as mobile, in getting ready for bed. One of the women was much older and cranky. She seemed to take an instant dislike to me when I first moved into the room, but warmed up to me after I helped her. When the lights went out, I decided to lay on my stomach and say my silent prayers. To the casual observer, it would have looked as if I was asleep. During this time, I could hear the woman that I helped argue with herself about me. She stated that I was nice, and then she replied to herself stating that I am not what I seem or something to that effect, and it went back and forth like that during my prayers. Shortly after, the room started getting really cold really fast. I silently prayed to God to watch over her and free her from any negative influences. It was then that I heard her say these words very loudly. I don't know the Lord's prayer and my name. I freaked out, quickly processing what had just happened. The woman knew that I was praying over her and there was no way that she could have known that. In my mind, I instinctively knew that I was not up for the confrontation. I was weak and still recovering. I got up from my bed, and with my back to her, I said something like, There is no way I can stay here now. To which she answered, Yes, go. I won. And laughed really hard. I was amazed that the other two women had slept through it. It was around 10 p.m. when this occurred. The room was stiflingly cold at this point, and I ran to reception and asked to be discharged, but the charge nurse said that I couldn't leave without my doctor discharging me. I begged again to be discharged, but was denied, and the nurses tried to call me as they got a hold of my doctor, who said that he would be in at 7 a.m. and that I needed to stay put. I asked to be relocated to another room in the interim, but the only available room was directly next door, and that was way too close for my liking, so they put me in the day room with a blanket and pillow. I used my phone to call my sister to get me out of the hospital. She works at another hospital, and told me the car wasn't home and to catch an Uber to her place. The ward was locked down for the evening though, so I couldn't leave anyway, and chose to just stay in the day room. The TV was on standby, but I could hear voices coming from it, even though the screen was blank. The voices talked about a shooting at the hospital I was in, with thousands of fatalities. 
It then talked about my baby nephew being in a plane that was shot down. By then, I was truly hysterical, as fear for my family took root and everything I learned went out the window. Throughout this time, the voices from the TV continued calling me names, etc. I couldn't stay any longer in the day room and the nurses had me on a stretcher right in front of the main desk where the charge nurse could see me. It felt like a really bad dream and I was hysterical and paranoid. I laid down on the stretcher and that's when I noticed hanging overhead the ward number 66. I was also on the sixth floor of the hospital. I wondered if that was why there was so much activity there. Not long after, I started hearing other voices coming from different rooms of the ward asking about me. They seemed to be communicating to each other and laughing. I started silently praying again with more conviction. A male patient in the ward nearest my stretcher started crying out for help, claiming that I was hurting him. I prayed even harder, citing the Lord's Prayer. He asked the nurse for the name of the lady outside hurting him, and she gave him my first name. He started crying again, joined by another voice two doors down. I prayed to know who they were in Jesus' name, and all these voices talked at once, but the one name that I could clearly make out was Beelzebub. I continued to pray throughout the first night as they taunted, laughed, cackled, and cried. At this point, the light in the man's hospital room was turned on as a nurse was with him trying to calm him down. I had been sitting up on my stretcher bed whilst praying and watched his silhouette as he tried to inch his way to the open doorway. It was then that I noticed the odd shadow that he cast. It was so strange. It looked like a spiky-headed being with a dog. Spiky-headed in an almost cartoonish way like Bart Simpson. It continued until morning and I was moved to a small private room awaiting the doctor. The voices were still verbally attacking and threatening me, but my hysteria was long gone by that point and I was just determined to leave. I ended up discharging myself before the doctor arrived, but had to return as I still had the IV catheter in my arm. On my return, they placed me in another ward. I refused to go back to Ward 66, and I was allowed to recover in peace. And eventually, the mnemonic taunting stopped. I had a course of bad luck following that event. Basically, all of 2019 was a series of misfortunes and bad luck that still hasn't come right. I don't know what to do other than just keep moving on. I went to a psychiatrist last December who said that other than the trauma I would need their help with, I was in good mental health. I work for a nonprofit that helps mentally and physically disabled people live fulfilling lives. J and C are brothers. I work for the same company as C, but at a different house. There are several houses around the city and bordering area. He works at the houses that only house children, four of them I believe. His story begins on a graveyard shift which he was working with one co-worker, a middle-aged woman. The house has alarms on the doors and windows which are alarmed during the night to let them know if any kids try to leave when they shouldn't. C was downstairs in the office. His co-worker was upstairs cleaning. Suddenly the alarms in the house went off, every door and window. He sprang up, assuming that the clients were planning some mass breakout as he would later refer to it. He yelled up to his coworker to head out one door. He went out the other, frantically looking for whoever was outside. He saw one client standing beneath a tree, but apparently not in any hurry. He thought he recognized the client to be someone we'll call B. He said, B, head back inside, or something to that effect. He continued searching for the other clients, but after running around in a panic, found no one. He gave up and headed inside to reconvene with his coworker. He said he found B, but no one else. She stunned him when she revealed that everyone was inside, never having left, including B. He said she must be mistaken. He was just outside beneath a big tree in the backyard. She had fear on her face when he insisted this. She explained how what he saw was in fact what staff of that house referred to as white dress. 
a ghostly woman wearing all white that seems to reside on the property and is often seen under that tree. Needless to say, he was surprised and confused and definitely creeped out, but the story doesn't end there. Sometime later, a client from another home whom C was very close to sadly died. He was sick for a while, and C was present for his final breaths in the hospital. He was wheelchair-bound when he was alive, and later a client at the white dress home needed a wheelchair temporarily while recovering from a slip-and-fall accident. They brought the wheelchair that used to belong to K. Right away, B began fixating on it. When it was no longer in use, B would take it for his own enjoyment. Staff took note of this and couldn't explain why he loved it so much. He would take it outside to a small hill, push it down the hill empty, and then return it to the top and do it again, over and over. B is nonverbal in that he can't speak with spoken language, but he does understand speech and communicates using gestures. One useful gesture has him select staff's right or left hand in a sort of this or that conversation. For example, I could hold out my hand and say, B, do you want tacos for dinner? Identify it as my left hand option. Or do you want burgers for dinner? Right hand. And then he would choose. He also had a tick where he would hold his palm up to his face very close and sort of mumble into it. This is actually what C thought he saw when white dress was under the tree. He thought B was there and that he was doing that. This is important because B would often do this gesture when he played with the wheelchair. Staff got curious and thought that they might be able to determine who B was talking to and playing with in the wheelchair. They posed a sequence of this or that questions with fake names. B, who's in the wheelchair? Is it Michael or Emily? No response. Is it James or Samuel? No response. Is it Stephanie or Teresa? Again, no response. They did this a few times before inserting the real name. Is it Kay or Jen? Right away, he selected the correct hand. Everyone present was shocked. According to C, he was the only real link between Kay and this house. B and Kay didn't know each other and he didn't believe anyone talked of the previous owner of the wheelchair, so he can't explain how B seemingly knew Kay's name. The story still doesn't end there, however. For reasons unknown to me, C took the wheelchair home for a while. Maybe it was a keepsake. Regardless, he brought it home with him and weird things started happening around his house. C and J, like I said, are brothers. They live in a big house and rent it out with their girlfriends as well as two others. One day, everyone was out except for J as well as C's girlfriend. Both of them claimed that the door to C's room slammed much too loudly and hard to be explained by wind, especially since no windows in his bedroom were open. This happened a few times while the wheelchair was there, which is made more interesting when you know that Kay would often get C's attention by slamming doors. Jay said other strange things had happened once the wheelchair arrived too, but I'm not sure what they were and don't want to confabulate the details. I do know that he claimed to once hear someone calling out his name, but no one was home except him. As I said in the opening of this post, both J and C were and still remain skeptics. They agreed that these events are all strange, but ultimately they aren't convinced. I too am what I call a hopeful skeptic. I would love for any sort of paranormal subjects in the world to be verified, but I guess I just need to see it myself to believe it. I believe in the paranormal, but I will go out of my way to weigh out every logical explanation that I can possibly think of before assuming that something is paranormal. I've told myself that this is sleep paralysis to make myself feel better, but it was such an odd encounter. I was 14 at the time that this occurred. I'm now in my late 20s. And I was really into gothic stuff, witchcraft, spooky shit, etc. I had a friend who had a Ouija board and wanted to come spend the night and play with it. Of course, I jumped on the idea, so she came right over. 
As I predicted, absolutely nothing happened. Though at one point the piece did slide off of the board, but we ended up blaming each other. I'm still pretty sure it was her. After a while, as I said, we got bored and we gave up and went to sleep. About a week later, I came home from school and felt tired, which was abnormal for me because I'd normally throw my backpack down and immediately go outside, but I decided that I would take a nap. No one was home except me. I went to bed and passed out immediately. I woke up and couldn't move and panicked. I've never had sleep paralysis before, nor had I even heard of it. So needless to say, this was horrifying. I then levitated off of my bed and toward the middle of my room where I began to rotate in a slow circle. I felt like I was screaming internally, yet no sound was coming out of me. And then I finally woke up. I bolted out of my room and stayed up for the rest of that day. My mom insisted that it was sleep paralysis and reassured me that it happens to people sometimes, so I thought nothing of it and moved on. About a month later, it happens again, at night this time. I floated toward the center of the room like before and promptly from there was slammed against my upper walls and ceiling by some sort of force that I couldn't see. I could feel its hands on me though and I could physically feel myself hitting the wall. I felt tingly as well, as if my soul might fly out of me. I don't know exactly how to describe this feeling. It was almost like I was vibrating? Like when your foot falls asleep, but the needle jab numbness feeling doesn't feel quite painful. It was strange. I thought it was just sleep paralysis and reminded myself that I was dreaming to try and calm down and started sort of willing myself to wake up, if that makes sense. I woke up, put on some music, and went back to sleep and slept fine. The next morning I got up for school and was absolutely covered in bruises. It literally looked as though someone had beaten me with a baseball bat. So I told my mom, who said that I had probably just thrashed around in my sleep. This wouldn't be possible though because I slept on a very soft, queen-sized mattress and I'm a small person. I even went around my bed to see if there's anything that I could have bumped into. There was nothing. She said maybe I had hit myself in my sleep, but there were bruises on my back and shoulders too, so it just didn't make sense. I tried to just brush it off, but by this point I was getting really paranoid. For the next few weeks I would have instances where I would start to fall asleep, my body would tingle like it did in the last experience, and I knew that if I let myself fall asleep that I would have the weird sleep paralysis again so I would force myself awake and adjust my sleeping position and then try to fall asleep once more. I would do this repeatedly until I could finally drift off without this tingly sensation. This became a daily thing, but I was okay with that because I figured out how to basically avoid sleep paralysis and thought that the creepy dreams were over with. A couple of months go by with no incidents and I had pretty much forgotten about it. By this point, it never really crossed my mind anymore, but I would still have the tingly feeling from time to time. It was Saturday. My mom was out with friends, my siblings were visiting family, and I was home alone. I kept feeling very strongly like I was being watched, but I told myself that I was just being paranoid and that it was nothing. This is where it gets weird. I'm sitting on my bed, wide awake, writing in my journal. It's about 9 p.m. or so, the radio is on full blast, and all of a sudden I'm snatched off of my bed while wide awake by this invisible thing. I start screaming, and it starts slamming me into walls again. Finally, after a few minutes, it stops, and I float back to the center of the room where I slowly start spinning in circles mid-air, much like the first experience. Only this time I can see myself lying on my bed on my back with my legs crossed as they were when I was sitting there, hyperventilating with my eyes open while some sort of figure sits next to me. It looked like it would be extremely tall if it stood up. It was skinny with a masculine looking build. Think tall and very skinny but muscular man. It had shoulder length wavy hair, though it was really more of just like a shadowy outline of hair. 
Its body was made up of swirling black smoke only. And I don't know how to explain this any better. This smoke was darker than just being black. Like imagine if the color black could be darker than it already is. That's what that color was. I have literally never seen a color this dark anywhere else. It was like seeing a color that no one has ever seen. The thing had big yellow almond-shaped eyes and a tiny black pupil in the middle of each one, but I couldn't discern any facial features. It didn't move. It just sat there staring at me for what felt like hours. Finally, I jump awake and I'm laying in a pool of sweat. I immediately start crying and flipping out because like I said before, I did not fall asleep. I was wide awake and sitting up when this happened. I wasn't even thinking about sleep. I wasn't even tired. My pen was still in my hand. My radio was still up loud and my legs were still crossed. Maybe I fainted, but that's never happened to me before. Thankfully, we moved shortly after that and it never happened again. But to this day, the hair on my arms stands up when I remember this thing. I've read a lot about sleep paralysis demons and experiences and nothing seems to quite match what happened to me. My mom had always told me that I was gifted. I could always feel energies. I had dreams of things that would come to happen. I wouldn't say I'm a medium or anything like that. I've never communicated with spirits. More so, I'd say I attract them. We hopped apartments a lot when I was younger, and no matter where we went, an entity would immediately find me. I'd have recurring nightmares, see figures, be scratched, etc. You could say spirits like to pick on me. Another random fact that will come into play later. I had bright blue eyes like my mother. We moved into this apartment and things immediately went very, very poorly. I had a dream that only lasted seconds. I was in a bright white room and there was this beast on the ceiling and it looked into my eyes and roared. It was so incredibly loud. I woke up and my mom and her boyfriend at the time had rushed to my aid because they heard me let out a scream that sounded like a deep, full-grown man's scream, not a prepubescent voice. My eyes turned hazel with brown splotches and have been that way ever since. I was terrified. We moved me into my big brother's room. That night, I felt a presence, opened my eyes, and I saw a shadowy figure reach out and try to grab me. I sprinted out of the room and slept next to my mom or on the couch in the living room from then on, but I always felt watched from the hallway leading to my bedroom. Another thing that happened was when I was laying in bed with my mom and her boyfriend, she looked up and saw a little girl in a petticoat standing in the hallway. He saw it too. I was asleep and only knew this because they told me years later. Anyhow, everyone was being terrorized for months and eventually we had enough. We hired someone to come in and she immediately detected a demonic presence. She had informed us that the building used to be a medical waste facility. They'd dispose of and store blood in the basement. That sort of thing. My mom has told me since that she was able to confirm this detail, but to be truthful, I never asked how. Thinking about and speaking about this incident brings me terrible feelings. Anyhow, she blessed the place and it didn't really do anything. We tried writing scripture on the walls and this sort of highlighter stuff that you could only see in UV light. We put up some crosses, that sort of thing. It only served to make whatever it was angrier. We eventually moved out, and my mom spoke clearly as we left. We're leaving. You are not allowed to follow us. I've never had another experience with a spirit. A friend of mine who says that she is a medium, 
I'm not sure what I believe about this sort of thing. Told me that maybe God, maybe a spirit, maybe myself, walled myself off spiritually from my gift. I think that maybe it was the same spirit tormenting me my entire life up until that point. When I think about this, tears immediately begin pouring from my eyes. I'm 20 now. And this was easily one of the most turbulent times of my life. So I've been watching Bad Mood Rude and she posted the sellers where she gets her haunted dolls from. I decided to get one for myself and her name is Sandy. Some info about Sandy. Her husband was in the mob. She had alcohol and drug issues. She's nice and loves music. She also has PTSD. I've had Sandy for three days now, and I've already had some experiences with her. My first experience was her giving me one of her PTSD episodes. I think she was trying to show me how it feels for her. But how it started was my left arm got cold, and then it started getting pins and needles. My heart started racing, so I sat up in bed and started taking deep breaths, and I said to Sandy, Wow, Sandy, that's intense. You're really strong. As in, her energy is really powerful, and from my right side, I heard a faint, echoey voice say, Oh, I'm sorry. And eventually it stopped, and I heard her crying, because I think she was scared. I told her that she was okay, and to come and sit in bed with me, and crying stopped. To add, Sandy used to have fights with her husband a lot, and when this happened, my roommates, they're a couple, were having a fight. I heard them going back and forth through the vent. On the second day, I was in bed with my boyfriend beside me watching TikTok. I hear outside our door what sounds like heels walking on some sort of hard flooring. Note, we don't have anyone in the house who wears heels, and we have like plastic thin flooring. Hopefully someone knows what I mean. It went on for a bit, then no walking, and it starts again. I tell my boyfriend, hey babe, uh, do you hear that sound? Ironically, our other roommate in the room beside us walks out to go to the washroom at the same time as I heard the heels tapping, so my boyfriend thought I was just crazy and said that it was our roommate. Even though he's a dude and very much doesn't wear heels. Today I did a spirit box, and Sandy came through giving me clear answers and in full sentences, and she likes living with me apparently, so I'm happy with that. Sandy is really great, and I love having her here. She always seems to show me her presence, but not my boyfriend, who's a huge non-believer in ghosts. And I really think she likes me because I want to help her with her PTSD, and instead of freaking out about the PTSD episode, I handled it and tried my best to get her to calm down. Every time I get up, I feel her following me, and it's like she's watching over me, protective, basically. She had kids while she was alive. I really love having her in my home, and she's not scary at all. I know a lot of people are going to say negative stuff on this post like, why would you invite a spirit into your home on purpose? And, oh, all spirits are negative. And to that I say, well, I like the paranormal and Sandy is not negative. If she was, I would feel it. I would feel fear when she shows her presence and she would be trying to hurt me. But she doesn't want to hurt me. Very clearly, she just wants to be understood and be known that she is there. She's honestly so sweet and motherly. She's just got some issues like any living person does, because she was living once too. I'm not a superstitious person, and I know that not all spirits are bad, and this is a PSA for everyone. Not all spirits are bad, but a lot of people like to assume that they are, and I don't like that at all. People like to only notice the bad ones and ignore the good spirits. Personally, I look at all spirits as good, but sometimes troubled. I believe in the paranormal, but I'm skeptical about most of the stories that people tell. It's extremely hard to distinguish between a fabricated story and a true story when you can't see facial expressions or hear changes in a person's voice. About a week ago, I was sitting in my kitchen browsing the web, probably Reddit, on my phone. 
My kids had been asleep for about an hour and my wife was in our room finishing up a paper for work. There wasn't a radio or television on. While browsing in complete silence, I heard my wife cough several times. The cough sounded as if she had breathed in some water and was trying to get it out of her lungs. Jokingly, I jumped out of my chair and ran over to the room where she was sitting. I started patting her back and pulling her earlobes down, again in a joking manner. She looked at me like, what the hell? So I told her I was trying to help since she had coughed so hard. She, still with the what the hell face, looked at me and said that she hadn't coughed. I stood there and evaluated what I may have heard. I thought it might have been one of my kids, but the cough was from a woman. It wasn't a four-year-old or one-year-old girl's cough. Other things about this cough is that it came from inside the house. It was the type of hack like after water goes down the wrong pipe. It was one succession of coughs, about four of them together. How did the coughing not continue if the coughs were heard that hard at the beginning? It didn't and still does not make sense. But that's not the only thing that happened. Fast forward to the next morning. My kids are awake and eating in the kitchen. I'm in the living room watching TV, still waking and drinking coffee, and my wife is in our room getting ready for the day. All electronics are off except the TV and our phones. My wife's phone rings from what sounds like the kitchen area. She runs to the kitchen to answer it because she was expecting an important phone call from work. She searches for her phone in the kitchen, but does not find it. She asks if it was my phone that rang, but I told her no. My phone was in my pocket. Turns out, both my wife's work phone and personal phone are in our room on the other side of the house. We checked the kitchen and surrounding rooms for anything that could have made the ring, but we found nothing. I don't know the name of the ringtone, but it's a very common ringtone for iPhones. My wife and I searched for the reasoning of why we clearly heard a phone ring in the kitchen, but no matter how hard we tried, we were unable to find a logical explanation. I was going to write it off as just another weird coincidence, but I kept thinking of how clear the phone ringing was, and how my wife had heard it too. Add this one to the cough that I heard the night before, and I start to worry that there may be an intruder in my attic. I think, nah, not possible. But I have two little girls and a little boy too. It's a slim chance, but I'd feel better if I just went up there and checked. I texted my wife to watch the kids because I was worried that there might be an intruder. I didn't want to verbalize it because if they were up there, then they would hear me. I check outside and around the house first for any signs of a person being on the roof or anything like that. I look for cuts in the wall and see no signs of intrusion whatsoever. I then grab the ladder to get inside the attic. The only way into this attic is through a small, two by four foot opening at the top of the interior of a closet in one of the rooms. I grab my flashlight and my gun, set the ladder up, and plan on entering the attic as quickly and tactfully as possible. I don't want the intruder to be lying in wait. I push the drywall that blocks the opening and can hear a door swing and shut. I say swing because it sounded like a door that was on a hinge or hinges. I can't get the drywall off and the element of surprise is now gone. I push through anyway and inspect the attic. The attic has no floorboards. You have to navigate through it by standing on the supporting beams. It's extremely annoying to have to go up there to do housework. I find no signs of anyone being up there, no entry points, and again, no cuts in any of the walls. I come down and double check that my wife and kids had stayed in the living room like I had asked in case there was an intruder. She confirms that they were and that no door had been shut. I pretty much already knew that the door shutting wasn't them because the sound came from the attic, but there's no door in the attic. I went through a checklist of explanations to the cough, the phone ring, and the door shutting, and again, have yet to encounter a single one that makes sense. I know it sounds weird, but a freaking portal is what I'm coming up with. I lived in this house for years, and have always heard weird noises, but never something like this. Most portal stories I've heard sound totally far-fetched. Usually a portal story includes a demon or something spiritual, but this was just totally random. People crossing dimensions to hang out in my attic? 
There's no malice, no sightings, no physical evidence, but the sounds were definitely heard and are inexplicable. Something else happened a few nights ago. It was around 11 p.m. I'm asleep in bed and am woken up to my wife shaking me. She tells me that she heard a door close. I say to her that it may be our four-year-old, but she says she was watching the monitor and the cameras were on the kids. She said that she had been watching the monitor because she had been hearing weird noises. I say maybe it's just the house creaking. She claims that she heard the windows shake. Now this is significant to me because we do have some old windows. The difference between the old and new windows is that the old windows will rattle when a door is shut due to air pressure or when the house is shaking, earthquakes, and the new windows won't. So she heard a door close and the windows shake. That's enough for me to grab my gun and check for an intruder yet again. I do an interior and exterior check and of course find nothing. I go back to bed and once again conclude that there is a portal in my house. When I was in middle school, my mother and father did not live together. Eventually, we all moved into this apartment together in the local town. The local town is peaceful, calm, and barely any crime happens here. Obviously, when you're a kid, you can get scared of the dark and stuff like that. However, this wasn't just being afraid of what lurks in the darkness because there was actually something watching me as I fell asleep. The first night I slept there, I just kept getting the feeling as if something was staring at me from the hallway. My bed was almost completely centered to where the door was, and my door was always open so I would always be able to see what was outside. And I would just stare, always, down the hallway, thinking that something was looking back at me. It wasn't long after that before I started actually having paranormal encounters. The first paranormal encounter I ever had, one night I was sleeping in my bed. I remember feeling like something was watching me again, except this time, I rolled over to see a large, black, shadowy man standing in my doorway. My eyes began to tear up and I hid under my sheets, but this strange pressure came over my body. It was almost as if I couldn't breathe or talk and then my ears would start ringing, and I would fall asleep with a snap of a finger. Then I would have this nightmare of my parents coming into my room slowly, coming over to my bedside table and screaming at me. Their faces would just rot away into this deep, black shadow face, which I named Black Eyes. I would then wake up, usually in a completely different room, not knowing what I was doing. Sometimes I would be standing in the bathroom, or laying on the couch in the living room. A few times I would be standing over my parents' bed, just looking at them. This event reoccurred more times than I can even count. Then, finally, my family began to notice the figure as well. My mother at the time would have friends over and they would say something like, Did you just see that man walk down your hallway? She would see it too. The same thing that I saw that would stare at me and put me to sleep at night. There would be strange events around the apartment, such as the TV changing channels, random phone calls from unknown numbers in the middle of the night. One of the most random occurrences in the house would be the random, horrible smell of death coming from the bathroom. This happened about once a week at a random hour. Nobody could figure out why the bathroom would smell like rotting death, and no matter how hard my mother attempted to clean the bathroom, the smell would not go away until about two hours later. It would just randomly disappear, with no explanation as to what it could have been. Many people who came over would see this shadow figure. My father didn't want to believe it, as he didn't believe in ghosts. But my mother was fully prepared. She had lived in a haunted house before and wasn't surprised by what was happening. Nobody would act like they believed me when I tried to tell them what I was seeing and why I was sleepwalking at night, but in reality, I think my mother was scared. 
She didn't want to tell me, with me being a kid and all, that I was possibly being possessed by this shadow man and being forced to walk around the house at night. Then came one night when we had to call the police. There was music coming from downstairs around 1 to 2 a.m. We knew that the downstairs neighbors had just moved out of the apartment, but we were awoken by this church-type music. We informed the police, and they came down to the apartment only to find a locked door. They busted it down to find absolutely nothing but music on a track playing by itself in the middle of the room. We were informed of this, and that only created more of a mystery. It was evident by that point that there was something in that apartment. Something dark. Something that didn't have good intentions. Eventually, after a few years, we decided it was time to move out. We had gotten a puppy, and she was barking down the hallway at nothing, and one night, a plate fell onto the ground from the cabinet. It was time to go. The final night in the apartment, my mother and I both awakened to a horrible noise of what sounded like a chainsaw destroying the kitchen cabinets. We both ran out to turn on the lights and find absolutely nothing. We both look at each other like, did you hear that? But couldn't say anything and went back to bed. It was completely terrifying. I'm not sure what we were dealing with at this apartment. I'd like to say that it was just a ghost, but it seemed powerful. I have lived in my apartment for three years now, and other than things falling randomly that I would usually blame on my cats, I have never experienced anything paranormal. My boyfriend claims to see white lights at night in our bedroom, but I don't know. I feel there is always a logical explanation for things. Yesterday, I felt particularly spooked in my apartment, and I felt like someone was behind me, like felt a presence. But also, I am a fat baby when it comes to these things, so I never take myself seriously. Anyway, this is where it gets weird. That night, my phone rang. I was expecting a call from my best friend, so I pick up and say hello. What I heard was a doll-like voice, laughing and giggling. She has a one-year-old daughter who does not sound like that, but I just assumed it was her, so I was like, aw, hi, all the while being creeped the F out and wondering what her daughter, who goes to bed at 8, was doing up at 12 a.m. Then it quickly cut to my friend and she was like, was that you? What are you doing? Tell me, are you joking with me? I felt the blood leave my face. I was like, no, what did you hear? Thinking she heard the same thing or maybe some static. She was in shock. She told me she heard a demonic man voice say, hello, clearly, and then cut to me saying hello. We spent the next few minutes arguing, as she thought I was joking with her and I thought she was joking with me, even though she was not the type of person to do something like that. We established that it could have just been a weird glitch or something and left it at that. I am so spooked from this, though. Has anyone experienced something like it? I never heard a sound like that in my life, other than maybe in movies. I'm glad she heard something too, because I feel like no one would have believed me. I don't usually get static or anything on my cell phone. Neither of us were watching something on it beforehand, and the sounds we heard were clear as day. Help me find a logical explanation.
As an eight-year-old child, I was given a porcelain doll by a very dear family friend, Miss Marion. She was all the time coming across things and giving them to me. This doll was the last thing she gave me. I was never really into dolls at all growing up, but I took the doll and placed her in my room in a small, child-sized rocking chair. The chair sat right next to my closet and dresser beside my nightlight. The doll was very pretty. She was dressed in a peach and cream colored dress with an apron and petticoats. She had little black Mary Jane shoes that when removed showed her delicately painted toenails. Her body was soft, only her head, forearms, and legs from the knee down were porcelain. Her lips were pink and her dark brown hair hung in slightly frizzed and now loose curls. Her eyes were brown her cheeks a rosy peach color, all like mine. Miss Marion had a point of saying that the doll reminded her of me, which is why she gave her to me. From the moment that doll came into my house, things began to happen. I was always uneasy with Claire. I never wanted to touch her, and when I played in my room, it felt as if she were watching me. It wasn't anything to panic about, but I do remember feeling like if I did something wrong, she might actually tell on me. How ridiculous does that sound? The first real occurrence I remember was when I was reading in my room, ghost stories if you can believe that, when a musical carousel horse that sat on my dresser began to play. Not just a couple of notes, like old mechanical music boxes will do at times, but like someone just wound it up fully. I sat stunned and stared at the little horse as it moved up and down in time with the music, and then it just stopped. Not wound down, just suddenly stopped. I was a pretty brave kid. I didn't run, and I didn't tell my mom. I just let it go. The next thing that happened was the voice. For several nights, and on into these years, I was woken up by what sounded like a woman inches from my face shouting my name. I would jump and sit up and find my room empty. Those happenings died down after a few months. She then started to plague my little brother with the same thing, and now that he and I are grown and gone, she's moved on to my dad. The little things started to get to me. I'd put something in a certain place only to find it later on the floor or on my dresser, right next to Claire. All my missing items eventually turned up around her. Once a ring ended up in the pocket of her apron. Books would fall off of my shelves, and a perfume smell would sometimes fill my room. The doll itself didn't smell at all, but the air around her would. My catalyst to finally get Claire out of my room was the night I woke up after hearing thumping around near my closet. I opened my eyes, sat up in bed, and of course my eyes were drawn to the nightlight where Claire sat. As I watched, the source of the thumping became clear. The rocking chair Claire occupied was rocking on its own. I had thick shag carpet, so there's no way it was rocking just by chance. If that wasn't enough, Claire's feet, which were both turned to the side facing opposite each other, slowly straightened themselves to be both pointing directly up. This part still freaks me out 20 years later. She then turned her head, which was quite impossible to do since it was attached, fixed to her cloth body. She looked toward me, and every music box in my room, four of them, started to play at once. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't feel endangered so much as I just felt scared of what was happening. I screamed for my mom and dad. The music stopped, but Claire maintained her gaze in my direction. And this is why I hate dolls. Even after that, I couldn't get rid of Claire totally. I ended up stuffing her in a box in the back of a storage closet. She's still there as far as I know. So is the woman who now screams my dad's name in the middle of the night 
and not in the kinky way. While I think she explains some of the oddities that happened in my parents' house, I don't think she's the tie to it all. This happened a few years ago while I was still in college. My best friend of many years is back in town, so we decided to get together and we stayed out fairly late, but hey, we're college kids, nighttime is our thing. My friend is very, very Catholic, and she decided to drive us this night. Mind you, neither of us was doing any drinking. After many shenanigans and lots of catching up, it was time to go home. It was probably around 2, 3 a.m. Still not exhausted, but she definitely was. Well, I'm staring at her dash where one of her many Catholic baubles were in the car when we get to the last light before she drops me at my house. I look out the window, as one does, and was met with the person in the car next to us staring into the car, and I kid you not, I screamed. The guy had gray skin, black eyes with no white, and a smile that was too long with sharpened teeth. He didn't break eye contact with me, and I was freaking out. My friend was completely oblivious until I said her name. She somehow didn't hear me scream. I as calmly as possible told her to look at the guy in the car next to us, and then she silently screamed too, and then proceeded to freak out and gunned it out of the intersection. Once again, this was 3 a.m., the light was still red, and she was not having this. She sped to my house and had me watching behind the car to make sure that we weren't being followed, whilst praying aloud, something she never does as she knows that I'm not religious. A few very short moments later she pulls up in front of my house. She also put her high beams on as I walked to my door because she was, again, not about this. After I was safely inside, she called my cell and had me on the phone until she made it to her house all of three minutes later. We were both really shaken up about it the next day, but we never talked about it again. Anytime I've tried to bring it up, she shudders and changes the topic immediately. She did tell me she went to be blessed the next day, on a random Tuesday. I can still feel the soul-shaking sensation of looking that guy in the eyes. I'm not saying it couldn't have been some dude dressed up in a costume or something, but it shook both of us to our core. It was a Monday night, at around 3 in the morning, and I honestly don't feel like this was a normal human occurrence. To begin with, I should explain some basic personal history. Real names will not be revealed, obviously. I have a family of five plus two spouses. My parents, my two brothers, my oldest brother's wife, and mine. Before getting married and moving out with my wife, I lived in the same house for 19 years. My parents bought it when I was like six months old, and I got married during college, so I've only ever known that house and my current apartment. I had some traumatic experiences when I was very young that are tied to one of the rooms in my parents' house, and then a few years later my parents had me move into that room. During my time in that room, I started having vicious nightmares, all involving me watching helplessly as the people that I loved were brutally murdered in graphic and creative ways in which one constant fixture was a figure that seemed to be observing everything and watching me from a distance, never directly interacting with the chaos, but always on the edge of my vision. This figure always looked the same. A tall mass of complete opaque blackness, with the exception of an antlered animal skull where its head should be. Anyway, when I went to college, moving out of that room, the nightmare stopped completely. I didn't have a single one until I came home for winter break and stayed in that room again. During that break, my then fiancé stayed a few nights at my house with me. 
We slept in separate rooms, but both on the same floor. During the night, she texted me that she was having a panic attack and that she thought she was seeing a figure. When I asked what it looked like, she described the figure from my dreams exactly, and I told her to start reading Psalms in the hopes that it might help. She immediately felt better. Not sure if it was because of the scripture itself or if it was just a placebo, but I am a firm Christian, so I believe that it helped. We talked for a while about it before deciding to keep an eye out for more spooky shit. That night, I had the worst nightmare of my life. The next morning, I felt numb and out of commission, and I didn't fully recover until the next day. Every time I've gone back to that house since, I have felt an overwhelming, malicious presence there. It has the effect of weighing down on everything. It kind of feels like cotton in your ears, and making everything feel super depressing. Recently, there was another development. My grandfather passed away this last semester, and my grandmother moved into the house with my parents. She's a troubled person, and she brought a lot of toxicity and conflict to the home. Last time I was there with my wife, we immediately felt something horrifyingly evil. I've always had a sensitivity to spiritual things, and it was like nothing that I have felt before. I think that it was feeding off of the conflict in the house and making things worse. My cat, who we had brought with us, immediately slipped into what looked like a super depressive state. She wouldn't play or do anything, no matter how hard we tried. The kicker was the time that I decided to try something. I walked into my old room, the one tied to my traumatic experiences, and tried to feel for any sort of extra bad energy. It was tangible. My mom and I had repainted that room the last time I was down there, and it felt very cathartic. But the power was still ever-present. On an instinct, I touched a wall in the room and immediately had violent visions reliving my trauma. Except the spirit was there, watching and seemingly gloating. It felt like it was trying to rub what had happened in my face like a look what I'm capable of sort of thing. My wife told me that I went white as a sheet and began shaking and crying, but I don't remember it. It behooves me here to add that I have seen several therapists about my traumatic experience. I don't think it was a PTSD flashback, as I've mostly worked through everything and am pretty mentally stable now. I'm relatively certain that the presence in my childhood home is evil, even demonic. I've talked to my mom, and I get the sense that she doesn't really believe me. But my wife and I are pretty certain of it. This story takes place during the late summer in the 1960s in Iowa in a very small farming community. My friend's great-grandpa, Bob, owned a farm out there. He had acres of corn, wheat, potatoes, etc., but corn was his main crop, so he had a huge cornfield. It was around 2 a.m., and his grandfather couldn't sleep, so he went outside to get some fresh air. While outside, he noticed something that looked like a child walking around in the cornfield. So, Bob ran back inside and grabbed his double-barrel shotgun and woke the farmhand for backup. They combed through the cornfield in an attempt to find whatever was running around out there. After a while, they still couldn't find anything, so Bob told the farmhand to go back inside the house while he stayed on the porch to watch his cornfield. Then, as he looks at the gravel road between his yard and the fence line that led to the cornfield, standing on the road was a little girl around six years old or so, and she was wearing a white dress that made her look like she had just gotten out of church. Bob thought that his mind must have been playing tricks on him, so he tried to lay down on the couch to rest, but also stay somewhat alert. However, not even a minute after he laid down, he heard a knock on the screen door. He walked up to the door and slightly cracked the main door open. He saw the little girl and asked, May I help you? The little girl said, Mister, I'm lost and I don't know where my parents are. Can I come in the house and use your telephone? 
Bob felt uneasy and told her that he could get her a glass of water and that he can call her parents for her if she gave him the number. But he didn't feel comfortable allowing her in his home. He felt something off about the little girl. However, the little girl insisted to be the one to call and talk to them. And Bob said, young lady, it's two in the morning and I don't feel right letting a stranger into the house, little girl or not. The little girl started to get agitated and said, I'm not leaving until you let me in to use your phone. Startled, Bob told the little girl that he was going to call the police to come pick her up so that they could keep her safe and find her parents. He closed the door to go and call the police and he heard someone punch the door like a grown man. He walked back and cracked the door open again, but when he looked, he realized that it was still the little girl and that she was the one who had punched the door. But when he looked at her this time, she didn't have any eyes. Instead, she had pitch black orbs instead of eyes. And she said in a deep voice, let me in. Bob grabbed his shotgun and pointed it at the little girl and told her no and to go away. After this, the little girl looked right into the barrel and then back up at Bob, smiled smugly at him, and giggled before she ran back into the cornfield and disappeared. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with this job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things that I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time, there was something else that I couldn't quite place. It lingered for a few moments, then went out just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself that it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was indeed about to find a body. Holding onto a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location, and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it was when I had first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light in there. It was just an empty tunnel stretching the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. 
I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the bush behind me and the smell engulfed me and was even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized that the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away further into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was alright. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking and walked briskly back to my car as they drove away. Then I got the heck away from there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought that I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he simply responded with a concerned yes. A little background on this guy. He is the son of a missionary and has been around the world. He has seen, rather smelled this before, and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. There's always the chance of a very scientific explanation, and I hope that one is out there. When I was a kid, younger than 12, my mom took me to visit her old friends at their apartment. It was decorated in an odd fashion. Tapestries hung all over the place with old antique furniture and knickknacks lining the walls. We didn't visit there long at all. On our way out the door, my mom pointed out a statue that they had in their living room. It had a beard, eyes that looked straight ahead, and a walking stick that connected to the base of the statue. It was about half my height, hand-carved solid dark wood, and was sort of tribal looking. I remember thinking, I really hope they don't offer to let her have that thing. It's scary. And, of course, they gave it to her. I felt uncomfortable sharing the car ride back home with the statue. My mom was raving about how cool it was all the way there. I couldn't have been less happy. After we made it back, she placed it down next to the fridge in the kitchen, right outside the entryway. That sucked, because our kitchen was the center of our house. Anywhere you wanted to go, you usually had to walk through the kitchen. So, I told my mom how much I hated the statue, and how I really hated the idea of it being there in particular. My mom told me that I was just being silly, so there it stayed. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night. I couldn't stop thinking about the statue being on the other end of the house, and it terrified me. It made me feel unsafe. I don't know what I found to be so threatening about it, but the next day my grandmother agreed with my feelings. She told my mom that the statue made her very uneasy, and that it had a negative energy. My mom told her that she was overreacting, and that she wasn't getting rid of the statue. I felt constant anxiety. I would often refuse to leave my bedroom in the morning after having violent nightmares involving the statue. It was always something along the lines of the statue becoming animate and stabbing me to death with its walking stick. When I walked through the kitchen, I would literally push my back against the wall and edge around the room to avoid getting near the damn thing. In time, even my mom's friends agreed that it kind of weirded them out too. I hated it. And despite how much it scared people, my mom still wouldn't get rid of it. Though she did finally agree to move it to the living room in a more secluded space. One night I was sitting in the dining room doing my homework, and my mom was in the living room with her friend. I heard whispering that was akin to what you'd hear in a horror movie. Cryptic, overlapping, incoherent whispers. 
I immediately knew that the voices didn't belong to my mom or her friend, so I went into the living room to ask them if they had heard anything. And before I could speak, the look on their faces told me everything. My mom told me to come closer to her and said, we heard them too. We all agreed that the sound was unmistakably close to us, and it was clear as day. The source of the sound had come from, you guessed it, around the same spot that the statue had been moved to. We all just sort of stared at the statue for a minute blankly, and I don't remember what else was said after that. But still, my mom refused to get rid of the statue. The nightmares continued. My anxiety grew worse and worse. Bad things constantly happened in the house. My mom got pregnant sometime around then and had to be hospitalized, so I went to live with my grandma for a bit. I told her all about how my mom never got rid of the statue and how I had never felt safe since it arrived. I told her about the nights that I felt someone looming over me and the times when I locked myself in the bathroom because I heard noise coming from it. After my mom delivered my baby brother, I moved back home. My grandma explained to me that she had burnt the statue long ago and didn't care how my mom felt about it because I didn't deserve to live in fear over a stupid piece of wood. Once the statue was long gone, my mom finally stopped being stubborn and agreed that strange things had occurred. I was finally able to walk through my house again without tiptoeing around it. But sometimes, I still felt off about the house after that. This paranormal encounter took place at the hotel I worked at last year. I was 20 years old, working at a small mom-and-pop hotel in Ontario, California. I had worked there for some time before I started to stay there for a few months. The owner taught me everything that I needed to know so that I can run his business while he went on a business trip to Africa. Mind you, I didn't have a car, so my only option was to stay there and work around the clock if need be. I didn't have to pay for the room, and I got to wash my clothes in the laundry room. There was a grocery store in walking distance, and restaurants all around me where I could get food at a discounted price since I worked at the hotel. I thought this was a sweet deal. One night, my boyfriend came down to visit, and while he was in the bathroom, I heard banging coming from the room next to ours. Then, I heard scratching on my walls. I told him to stop playing, and he didn't even know what I was talking about. The banging continued all night, so I called the front desk and told them that the people next to me were loud and that I had to be up at 6 to go down there to work. She was quiet for a moment, and then she told me that she hadn't rented out the room next to mine. Mind you, I had an end room. I quickly ran outside to see if the curtains were open or closed, and they were open. I could see right into that room, and no one was there. I had never been so creeped out in all my life. I decided to sage the room to get rid of any bad spirits or energy, and that worked for a while until it didn't. The next time something demonic happened. I was asleep and kept hearing whispers in my sleep. I hate whispers with a passion, and they creep me out to the fullest. So I sat up in bed and I was looking around the dark room, and in the corner of the room, I saw white, glowing eyes staring at me. I felt frozen by its glare. I could see its body and saw that it was crouched down, holding its knees. Then I saw more shadows appearing closer and closer. I went to turn on the lamp next to the bed, and it didn't cut on. So my next thought was that I needed to run outside and get to safety. It took all the balls in the world for me to get up and do that. I was so scared that I couldn't even feel my legs. All I could feel was the cold wooden floor beneath me. I got to the door and flung it open, only to see that the bedroom curtains were on the outside of my room's window. The sky was black, and the clouds were a dark green with gray tint. I was mortified to realize that I was still asleep, and that I hadn't actually woken up. I looked back inside the hotel room and saw myself asleep in the bed. 
I screamed bloody murder, and that's when I jolted awake for real. I said a prayer and went back to sleep. The encounter that followed was even worse. Yet again, I could hear things in my sleep. I was terrified and couldn't move any part of my body. I began to pray in my head as loud as I could, only to wake and feel my body slam on the bed as if I had been levitating. I called my grandma the next day, and she said that it was a demonic attack. I got my car shortly after a few days later, and never stayed in that hotel again. My boyfriend at the time and I went to Key West in 2014 for vacation back in my junior year of college. Doing some bar hopping, we went into the main strip's Coyote Ugly Bar. I ended up sitting next to this very thin, dark-haired woman. When I asked her if it was alright if I sat there, she turned her head toward me in an incredibly slow manner. She nodded her head up and down, equally slow. I don't think anything of it. My boyfriend and I order a drink, and we're talking amongst ourselves for a minute. I'm facing away from the woman, and I feel her tap on my shoulder. So I turn around, and she's raising her glass to me in cheers. I should explain what she looks like, because it's a lot like what I imagine a demon wearing human skin would look like. Bone thin, sallow, with stringy black hair, sharp cheekbones, and nose. Her eyes were black. I mean huge black pupils that didn't blink. They looked static. She does her cheers and opens her mouth to smile and her gums are gray. Her teeth are gray and small. And I remember having this overwhelming feeling that she wanted to eat my flesh. I'm in pretty much panic mode at this point and whip my head back toward my boyfriend. He saw this woman too by now and he grabs me by the arm to get us to move to the back of the room as quickly as possible. I'm basically cowering. I know, super brave. I always loved reading about demons and possibly faced with one, I'm jello. I turn to start making our way out to the street and the woman has got her head completely cranked around to stare at me from the bar. I feel her gazing at me as we leave and I haul ass back to the hotel. She didn't say a single word throughout the entire encounter. I always regretted not asking her to speak. I will say my boyfriend and I talked about it after and considered the gray teeth and mouth and general craziness possibly due to drugs. But I've seen my fair share of drug addicts, even had one try to kidnap me. And this was not the same. I think about this episode pretty often, even years later. That feeling of encountering something soulless that wanted to harm me has never diminished. This happened to me two years in a row when I was young. Too young to face as much horror as I did. I was six, and it was Halloween. I was just getting into bed when I heard an awful screeching sound coming from the hall closet. It was right by my mom and dad's bedroom, but they didn't hear a thing, which really freaked me out. I slowly got up out of bed and ran silently to the closet. I opened the door and it took all my effort not to scream. I saw a yellow metal box. I opened it and saw the creepiest doll. It was a raggedy, ugly, old doll. Its hair was in two long, blonde braids. Her, I should say. I slowly picked the doll up. It screamed again, and this time I did too. From that night on, the thought of it lurked in my mind until the next Halloween, when I had another encounter with it. When everything happened again that year, I made up my mind and threw it away.
The next day, I had gone into the closet to get my hula hoop, and my eye caught the yellow box. I picked it up. I opened it, and an uncomfortable chill ran down my back. The doll had returned. I couldn't get rid of her. Ever. To this day, I still know its exact location. In 1996-97, I lived in a fairly old terraced house with a cemetery at the end of a road. Cliché, I know, but it's an important detail. Nothing remarkable about the house or the area, it was just convenient for college. Anyway, I was up late one night on the PC in my bedroom which looked out onto the street. It was about 2 or 3 a.m. For whatever reason, probably to give my eyes a rest, I wandered over to the window and looked down at the road in the direction of the cemetery, although it was too far down the street for me to actually see, and I saw three people walking slowly down the road. I could see that they were quite old and appeared to be dressed in funeral clothes, which, given the hour, was weird. There were two women and a man. I'd put their ages at about 80 and the woman in the middle was being steadied or guided by the other woman and the man as they came closer. I got the impression that she was upset. My first thought was that given their age, she had recently buried her husband and grief had caused her to behave slightly irrationally. It was all interesting enough for me to carry on watching as they got closer to the house. Just outside the front door of the house was a street lamp. I continued to watch them as they made their way past, but when they got to the lamppost, they all stopped, and the upset woman in the middle looked up at me and grinned. This is where it got even weirder. The grin became a sort of grimace, and if there was any color in her face to start with, it was now dead white. At that point, I realized that I was staring right into her eyes, but her eyes were pitch black. If you've ever crashed a car, the final split second before you make impact seems to drag out as you process more information than normal in the time frame. It was that sort of scenario. I'm sure that we only made eye contact for a second, but it felt like several minutes as my peripheral vision faded and I felt like all I could see were those two black holes in her face drawing me in. The distance between us didn't change, but somehow it felt like she was coming closer. At that point, the two people with her were just continuing to look down the road as if they were frozen, but waiting for this woman to finish with whatever she was doing. I was suddenly hit with this intense feeling of dread and panic, so I threw myself to the floor. As soon as I had broken away from her gaze, I felt pretty stupid that this upset old woman, who clearly needed help, had spooked me so badly. I looked out the window again, and there was no sign of them. I've always loved the paranormal. Even as a little girl, I found it fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience that I ever had. I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom and grandmother in my room when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye on my bookshelf where my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see that one of the doll's dresses was billowing around her and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks. I should mention that my mom rearranged them that day and had them all facing the same direction. Skip to the next day, I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something and I walked back in and all my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of my room screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again. My room had always been off, and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later, and this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls, and they would go off randomly sometimes. 
I started to feel like I was watched and I wasn't alone. But I just brushed it off as paranoia because I had never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college, after years of dealing with minimal doll movement, something changed. I was in my room one night and I felt something breathe down my neck and it scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night. My parents divorced when I was 15, and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was also a medium. I asked her when she came over to check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped in there, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because a family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-size, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that it was the one that she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls, and I don't feel anything in there anymore. This is just one of many experiences I've had and thought I would share. I still constantly check my bookshelf just to make sure, and it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls but I don't think I'll ever forget. I'm a die-hard agnostic skeptic with an open mind. I believe that anything is possible, but I want a logical and, preferably, scientific reason behind that anything. The last 10 days, however, have been absolutely insane. It started when I was a little kid. In my memories, I see kids between the ages of 5 and 11 with solid black eyes and smiles too big for their faces. I had a bad childhood, so I just figured they were added memories by an imaginative mind, because that's the answer that solidly fits my skeptical scientific world view. Last month, I started seeing a girl. She told me about her experiences with sleep paralysis and shadow people. I explained to her that it was a rational experience caused by being in a hypnagogic state. Then she brought up the Cheshire Cat Kids. Her recollections matched mine as a child. It was unnerving to say the least, and she and I spent almost an hour discussing the most minute details about them. Our stories matched. So, she does acid with her friends about ten days ago, and told me that she stepped outside. A group of six of them were waiting for her. They showed her scenes from my life that were my darkest. She described them to me too accurately for her to have heard them from a second-hand source, which would be hard to do anyway, considering that I don't like sharing such detailed information. They then told her that I was going to die soon, and that she should stay away from me. This has put a monkey wrench into one of the most promising relationships of my 25 years. Since that night, I have nightmares of them coming into my room, licking my forehead, and showing me the memories of my past as if they were happening in that moment, complete with smells, sounds, sights, etc. I have written this part off as my subconscious mind reacting with my long dormant PTSD, but they got more and more vivid. While this is happening, she has been distancing herself more and more. Last night was the weirdest part of the tale, however. I was driving down a windy country road to calm myself, and a pair of headlights flies from around a bend and runs me off the road, almost into a tree. When I looked, however, there was no car, and the headlights extinguished after passing me. I'm chalking all of this up to anxiety started delusions and possible schizophrenia, but I cannot explain how she knew what she did and why all of this is suddenly happening. I live in a small town, and things like rumors tend to spread pretty quickly since folks around here are incredibly nosy beings. The most trusted source of these rumors is the local bar located in the center of the small settlement that we live in, which my father visits frequently. 
It is right by the school that I go to. Anyway, two weeks before all this bullcrap started, he came back with quite the story. It is said that something off has been going on with our town's graveyard, which is right by these creepy old woods a little bit away from the town itself. Usually takes 20 minutes to get there by car. Apparently, drunkards there claim that there's a medium disguised as a homeless man hanging around the woods surrounding the graveyard and that sometimes he can even be found by the graves eating bread. At first, I didn't believe it, so me and my friend decided to walk to the graveyard and hang around there trying to find that guy. So we did, and the graveyard was full of people for a few hours, but the normal kind of people. A few more hours passed, and soon there was no one left except for an old, bearded man on the bench by the football field across the woods in the parking lot. He was looking at empty plastic bags with a box of cigarettes resting beside him. Nothing suspicious. My friend had the guts to walk up to him and insult him. I walked away from her, but when she crossed the line, I pulled her away, telling her that he may be a serial killer or a crazy drug addict. But he remained quiet until she yanked her hand away from mine, grabbed his box of cigarettes, and crushed it under her feet. She also threatened to hurt him if he didn't speak. And that's when he stood up and looked her dead in the eyes, and he was much taller than her too. He told her something along the lines of, you are a disgrace in the eyes of God, and walked away onto the road until we lost track of him. I started to worry, and told her that maybe he was a priest or a monk, and now was going to tell everyone in our town how she had mocked him, and I was actually afraid. She reassured me that he was none of these things, because he had cigarettes with him, but I think those weren't even his. That night I slept over at her house because I was scared to go back to mine alone. I woke up in the middle of the night, and since I was sleeping in the same bed with her, I had a clear view of the pitch black shadow of a man standing over her right beside her bed, his palm on her wrist. I raised my body, getting ready to stand up, but he turned his head to me and started to shake it from left to right. So I figured it was a lucid dream and rolled over to the other side, drifting back to sleep. The next morning, she looked pale and ghostly, and I asked her if she got enough rest. She informed me that she did not even sleep, and kept having problems with her breathing and her heartbeat. I was so scared that I almost pissed myself right there and then, and as of now, I am home alone and feeling like I am being watched. In October of 2018, I was hospitalized for four nights. I was put in the surgical wing due to lack of beds and was in a four-person room with all rooms near me having four people as well. The last night of my stay was on the 31st, which of course was Halloween. Other than it being noisy from the firecrackers outside, followed by the heavy rain, it was uneventful. I was particularly restless that night and not having an easy time falling asleep. Just before midnight, and I remember looking at the clock seeing 11.47 because I couldn't fall asleep, I saw a figure in the window next to my bed. It was a massive black dog, like a long-haired husky with the reddest eyes that I have ever seen. It was such a deep, but at the same time bright, crimson. It was just staring at me, and I felt completely frozen. I turned over and covered my face, and when I looked over some time later, it was gone. I should note that I was on an upper floor with a roof landing outside my window, so no way could an animal have gotten up there. I ignored it, called the nurse, and asked for something to help me sleep. They told me I didn't need anything and would eventually sleep on my own. About half an hour later, I saw the same creature staring at me from inside a window within the hospital across from mine. I immediately felt sick and panicked, and as quick as I saw it, it was gone. Several minutes later, my wing went on lockdown. The doors all closed, and all I could hear were screams and nurses running. The screams and panic went on for four hours. I found out the next morning that a pregnant woman in the room next to mine had died from an adverse reaction to the medication that she had been given. 
She went into complete psychosis and at one point was running through the halls, banging on everyone's doors, begging for help and telling us that the nurses were trying to kill her. I will never get those sounds out of my head. I had no idea what hellhounds were until I got home and searched. I had no idea what hellhounds were until I got home and searched for what I had seen. I've let it lay dormant in my brain since then, but recently I've been having dreams where they show up, and it's terrifying. I'm so lost as to what to make of it, and terrified to make any assumptions. I bought an old, antique Asian chest about 15 years ago. It was really lovely. I moved in with my parents while I was in college into the guest house out back. There was no room in the tiny cottage for the chest, so my mom had me put it in the walkway between the back of the house where my young brothers slept and the living room. Everyone, and I mean everyone, hated that piece of furniture. They'd scurry past it as fast as they could to get wherever they were going. Occasionally, we would hear knocking or a random door that would just open. One morning, my brother Justin and I left and went to run errands and go shopping. When we came back six hours later, my mom was raking leaves in the front yard. When we got out of the car, mom asked, Wait, when did you come get Justin? We told her that we had been gone all day. She said, no, you haven't. I just saw him two hours ago. I assumed he'd gone to his bedroom to play video games. I told her that we had been gone since early that morning, and she kept insisting that there was no way. He walked past her. She had said hi to him. She said that he didn't respond to her, but she figured that he had been on a mission to get to his room. When I asked her where she saw him, she said that she was vacuuming in the hallway in front of the chest. I ended up giving it to my older brother, who said that he would hear my nieces laughing and playing in the hallway of his apartment. He said one morning he got up to see the youngest run down the hall into her room, but when he got to her room, she wasn't in there. He threw it out. I wish he hadn't, and I wish that I knew where it was now. I was sleeping the other night, and I remember waking up, or rather, so it seemed, yet it still felt like I was dreaming. I was lying in bed and remember sitting up and seeing three figures standing in my room with a dimly lit blue light coming from somewhere that illuminated them. I don't remember exactly what they said, or rather he said, cause the one in the middle was speaking directly to me. I remember his mouth opening in a very inhuman way with the jaw extending further than it should be able to. Their mouth and eyes were black. Not like solid black, but a smoky type of black, so sort of gray. But you could still recognize teeth and such. I remember them saying something about them coming in a few days, but I don't remember what it was exactly. I then remember passing back out and waking up, actually waking up, and seeing some dark form dart across the room and hover directly over my bed. My bed is in a corner, so it was sitting or hovering between the wall and I, with about a four inch gap at the top at the time. I then felt a very, very intense sensation of dread and heaviness throughout my entire fiber and being and recall feeling this for a few minutes while it was just sitting there with my back turned to it. Then out of nowhere, a sense of euphoria and great peace came over me. No longer did I fear or dread anything, but rather I felt happy, at peace, loved. I don't really know how to describe it. I remember that thing, whatever it was, was no longer there. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual in the sense of believing and following my own route when it comes to what happens after human death. 
I believe in a very unique form of reincarnation in which the soul, essence, energy, consciousness, whatever you want to refer to it as, travels until it finds a new place to call home. And it could span across the entire universe. That being said, I couldn't help but feel like there was actually an evil presence there with me in my room, and a guardian angel, or some other known source of good energy, cast it out. I was home alone on Thanksgiving. It was 2015 around evening time, and I heard some knocking. Being in a festive and playful spirit, I opened the door without looking and automatically felt a deep sense of regret, sort of like a literal, oh shit, moment. I didn't know where it was coming from until I actively started trying to place what was wrong with the situation, and that's when I realized they didn't have any whites in their eyes. For a second I thought, isn't Halloween over? And was confused until the oldest boy made eye contact with me. And that's literally when I felt like I was staring death in the face. They wanted to come in and the way they spoke made it seem like they knew what I was thinking and were actively mocking my helplessness. I slammed the door on them, turned all my lights on and started watching TV while they stood outside and would occasionally knock. I felt like I lost a good six hours of time because I don't even remember when I fell asleep or what I was last watching. I remember when I first sat down, Gabriel Iglesias was playing, but I don't remember anything. When I woke up, it was around 2 a.m. and the lights were all off and there was only static on the TV. I have Dish Network and there were no power outages in my area and I don't get static if Dish were to go out. I would get a channel listed as an HDMI and a black screen, or it would be the introduction screen where it would show two people talking about the features of Dish Network. Also, if the lights went out, they would come back on. I had to literally switch the lights on and off a few times for it to work, but no one was home. After that, I would occasionally see them outside and every time it would be pin drop silence and my lights would occasionally go out or something would lose power like my dish. One time my phone that was at 63% dropped to 1% in five minutes. After a few months of being afraid of every knock, I decided to call an imam to bless the house. I also saged the house and brought a lot of different surahs, psalms, to put in every room, including the bathrooms. Since then, the visits have stopped. However, a few months after that, I remember hearing a blood-curdling scream and a banging sound on my door. I looked through the peephole and saw nothing. A few months ago, maybe two or so, my mom and I heard a banging coming from the front door. And same thing, no one was there. I don't know if it was them, or something coming back, or just kids playing a prank, but I was so terrified. Last night, I woke up from a vision where my boyfriend bit me right between the shoulder blades. I turned to look at him but he was deep asleep. The next morning, he told me that he saw a dream where I bit him between his shoulder blades. We were weirded out by this. There was no bite mark on his back, but it hurt like a bitch by his words. The day starts going by and I notice him acting strangely. I've been working mostly with spirits before and we live in a very old building with an interesting history but this was new. He said he can't control his own body, that there is someone else with him. I started to get my stuff to banish whatever there was. I kept talking to him while gathering my things. He wasn't acting like himself anymore. He was very rude, but in a charming way while eating grapes on our bed. I banished the thing, still unsure of what it was. The rest of the day has been normal, and I haven't felt any bad energies. 
but my boyfriend keeps telling me that the bite between his shoulder blades keeps hurting. Does anyone have any idea what I am dealing with here? I was going to my sister's graduation in Binghamton University and my family rented out a quote-unquote well-priced Airbnb for two nights. The only one that had five bedrooms because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics. It had trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people. It had ornate floral wallpaper and dolls. Many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms, and no one in my family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious, and I didn't see the room, and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation, so I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired, even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them. Because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so that I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while and turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me it's all in my head. By 3 a.m. I was half conscious. I was slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls just kept staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked and I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered, statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them, and I thought, oh my god, I am going to be stabbed to death. Then I heard vividly, in a playful, childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert. It was like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell back asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. That night I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept peacefully through the night. I am currently sitting in my bed at 12.35 in my time zone right now and was watching a YouTube video a couple minutes ago. Without warning, I suddenly hear a scream. My first thought was that it was part of my video, but I checked and it was not. It sounded like it was from a man experiencing pure terror and agony. It was a single scream from the worst fear and pain imaginable that lasted two to three seconds and then silence. My dog started barking once I heard it. It was hard to explain, but it didn't sound like anything a human was capable of making. More like a much more convincing sound from a horror movie. I have heard some weird sounds around the house, mainly in the kitchen and dining room, since I moved in. I'm pretty skeptical about things like this usually, but that was like nothing I have ever heard before. It's been four or five years since my last encounter. I think I'm safe, right? Wrong. 
I moved last year and I recently thought, hey, remember those kids a few years ago? Funny, they can't get you now. Boy, was I ever incorrect. I live on a mountain and like an hour away from the beach in a super populated neighborhood with my roommates. Two chill lesbians and a college dude. Super cool people. I think nothing can hurt me now because there are people everywhere. But no, I'm stupid and jinx myself. I was home two days ago. Class was canceled and the dude of the house was home too and taking a nap. I'm in the kitchen watching Netflix and doing homework when there's a knock on the window. Obviously, this is weird as hell, but I have weird as hell friends. Maybe one of them are trying to scare me. I brush it off and continue what I was doing and then it happens again. Once again, I brush it off because maybe it was the snow if it wasn't one of my friends. Things like this happen all the time with them. Well, it goes on for about 10 minutes and I'm kind of starting to freak out. My friends don't have this much patience. I go to Charlie's room, the guy, and wake him up. I'm not the one that's usually riled up, so he's concerned too. We both go to the window. I have my phone out with the camera and 911 within a touch, and Charlie has a bat. We look out the window, and no one is there. After a minute, we calm down and go and sit in the living room. Charlie's mom is a cop, so he says he'll tell her about it later. We think we're okay, so we chill and watch TV together. 30 minutes later, the doorbell rings. I go and open the door. At first, I don't see anything. Then, down on the bottom of the stairs of the apartment, I see three young boys dressed in black hoodies, jeans, with brown or black bangs. At first, I didn't move. I was frozen in place. Then Charlie asked who it was, and I came to my senses and got a good look at the kids, then slammed the door shut behind me. I started bawling, and I mean sobbing. I had no clue what to do. Charlie's freaking out because I don't cry, especially in front of people like that. He ran to the door with the bat that we have on the window seal and looked outside. He saw them too. He started freaking out because he didn't know what to do, so he started yelling at them to leave. He said they started smiling. I was crying even more now, and he was still screaming, and I think the neighbors wanted to call the cops. Now think about this. He didn't know what they were. He thought they were normal kids that had scared me. He didn't see their eyes yet. I started yelling at him to go inside when I hear a bunch of footsteps running up the stairs and Charlie screams and runs in. He's telling me he saw their eyes and that they were black. And now we're both freaking out and grabbing kitchen knives. Eventually we calm down and look outside again. No one's there, but we can see a group of kids past the complex with three that we think might have been the BEKs. I told him about the other thing that happened to me, and now we're scared to be in this house. We told the other roommates, and they thought we were high or something, so once again, no one believes me. This happened about three days ago, and I've been on edge ever since. So last year, I received a doll from my aunt. It was a hand-me-down that she found in storage, so I don't know its origin story. Her name is Alice. First weird note is that I immediately knew her name as soon as I held her for the first time. Anyways, originally Alice sat in my room, but one day while cleaning, I put her in my closet. After putting her in my closet, weird stuff started happening. I would hear her in there, usually her knocking against the walls. It was so loud that my friend could usually hear it over the phone. I would get reoccurring dreams of someone named the Medicine Girl. I would often awake from these dreams in sleep paralysis. Other objects and items would go missing randomly, only to be found in places where I had not left them. My grandmother's stuffed bear, that's at least 50 years old, would move across the room and end up in places that I also hadn't left it in. I practiced witchcraft, and the plants on my altar died. 
All of this stopped when I moved her out of the closet and back into my room. Due to all of this, I believe that she is haunted. However, I can't find anything online about what you're supposed to do with a haunted doll, and I'd like some advice. I believe she is scared of being alone, or doesn't like being hidden. Hence, everything stopped when I removed her from the closet. I'm an actor at a haunted attraction in Pennsylvania. I was playing Jason on the hayride scene tonight. I hop up on the hayride and walk up and down the middle of it and scare people. This is my second year doing it and I absolutely love this gig. But tonight, something happened that I couldn't explain. It was the second to last wagon of the evening. I was in the middle of the wagon, headed toward the front when I got a really bad gut feeling that something was off. I got chills immediately and tried to hide the feeling of terror I had at that moment from customers. I turned my head and to my left I saw a girl staring at me. She looked completely normal at first, until she blinked. In what seemed like hours I saw her blink in slow motion, her eyes going from the sides and meeting at the middle. After the first blink, I saw her eyes turn completely black. She cracked a small smile while staring at me straight through my mask and into my soul. I heard her laugh inside my head. I was frozen for a moment, and she blinked again and she looked normal. My body unfroze, and I tried my best to finish the wagon. This was literally the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. What? Did I see? I bought three small clown statues several years ago from a thrift store. They came in a box of about a hundred other handmade clowns and I picked out the cutest ones. Last year I moved into a new house and put the three clowns in a large display case in my living room along with the other trinkets. The case is completely inaccessible to the elements and is sealed by two panes of sliding glass. I got a horrible wave of fear one night a few months ago and for no apparent reason my first instinct was to check the display case. To my shock, I noticed that one of the clowns had turned 180 degrees around in the case and had positioned itself to look away from the living room. The glass had remained shut, and nothing else was out of the ordinary. I turned it back to face the right way and forgot about it until I felt the same wave of fear about a month later. Once again, I checked the case, and the same clown was turned the same 180 degrees around again. This has happened about five times now, and I'm starting to get really worried. I can't help but believe that it's a dark spirit or energy. I'm so freaked out. It's like the clown is trying to reach me, make me notice it, or perhaps get closer to the other objects in the case. I'm afraid to destroy it, move it, or touch it at all, because I don't want to absorb any energy or curse that it might contain. I live in an old house that was made during the 70s. When I moved in, everything was fine until last week. Last week I was home chilling on my bed reading a book when I heard a noise from the room next to mine. This room is where I keep old possessions from my grandma in the closet. There was one that always crept me out. Some old doll. The noise sounded like a bang, like a closet door being slammed. I went into the room to check and found the closet door wide open with stuff all over the floor. That doll was sitting there. It was sitting there looking at me. I am so freaking terrified right now. A 
A few years ago, my mom was sleeping downstairs, and she had an encounter with something inhuman. Anyways, I used to always get scared at night, and I would knock on their door to sleep with them. And one night, my mom heard a knock on her door, and she assumed it was me, so she said, come in, while still half asleep. She heard the door open, and heard something quickly patter across the ground and jump on the bed, and it began whispering in her ear and mimicking her voice. She freaked out, and opened her eyes, only to see a very skinny, small, webbed-looking creature running out of the room. Me and my dad awoke to her screaming. We believe the house was haunted because we all had paranormal experiences there. We believe it came to be haunted because the previous owners performed satanic rituals, etc. When I showed her that skinwalker picture that kind of went viral, she said they looked really similar. But we don't know if this was a skinwalker or a malvoyant spirit. Mm -hmm.